We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, not not super great news over on my side of things, uh, outside the Vancouver area of uh, BC. We are definitely into a second wave, uh, and we can call it that, because at one point we got down to only six new cases in a day. So I'd say that is definitely having flattened things at that point. But uh, cases are climbing back up now, so unfortunately going in there and... Uh, uh, definitely on a personal level, uh, one of the places that uh, has some new cases is the retirement home where a couple of my aunts live. So uh, very oh. concerned for them, but uh, at least it is actual apartments there. So uh, these are elderly folks who are all being isolated, like really, really isolated in their apartments right now. So uh, feeling poorly about that, but hopefully does not drag on too long. It was only one confirmed case there. Uh, so hopefully that can be isolated and not spread around. But um, yeah, concerning stuff. So please, everybody, do say stay... Uh, uh, stay safe, uh, take the correct precautions, and uh, yeah, let's let's try not to spread this thing until we get a vaccine. We, uh, here in Florida, we don't believe in second waves. Mm. We're just going to keep riding this first one until we all get it, I guess, is I think the plan. There needed to have been a, to be the plan. A, clear, a clear down before you can call it a second back up. And That's right. We don't, we don't, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going hard. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not stopping. Yeah, I had I gotten two, and th these are with not like rando people, but I had to have two uncomfortable conversations about that I shouldn't have had to have mm -hmm. with people because you know either you know they were in, impinging on me. Okay, you know like I I wasn't yeah you, know, you know we were in a place and they decided that you know they were going to do what they were going to do and they were going to they were going to stand and you know get right up on my grill and i was like you're gonna have to back up man i had to have this and not only that you have to take you and your whole family and just go mm -hmm. you need to leave because <laughs> this is not we are this is not social distancing and uh then uh we as you guys know i have workers in my house and again i had to say it again i'm like if your subcontractors don't want to wear masks ah they can go work for somebody yeah. else because they can't come in well, this house is, anymore. So now I'm... That's unacceptable. I'm ha that's that's it is clearly complete, It's no like... One. And I told the the contractor, general contractor, I said, listen, if one of your guys showed up to work with no pants on, right. you would say, put some pants or on. Or no and shoes. And if he said, I don't believe in pants, I don't think pants work, I don't think pants are necessary, and you know I, I'm not going to wear them, you would say, fine, go home, and you no longer work for right. me. Right. That's the exact same reaction you should have about masks right now. So if you bring somebody else into my house with no mask on, I'm going to like call the cops or something because clearly you can't be trusted. So I have to send it. I'm sending out an email. I've already written it, but I'm. it's one of those emails where I wrote when I was real super angry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm letting it sit for a little while. Take a second pass. <laughs> <laughs> my wife read it and she goes, I don't know about this interpretive dance part. I'm like, I'm trying to add some levity to this. <laughs> It really does have the words interpretive dance. Oh, all right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, I, I splashed out and purchased uh, respirators with uh, six-month filters for uh, all my family members because I'm like, uh, hey, you know what? Let's uh, – if we can't trust everyone else to protect us um, – then, then, and you guys are in Canada, where people are theoretically it's, nice. It's it doesn't seem to be as contentious, but I am I am not seeing nearly enough people wearing masks out and about. So uh, at least our malls and that are like that you can't come in if you're not wearing a mask. So those are pretty pretty okay on that front. But uh, but nonetheless, uh, if others won't protect us, then uh, we shall protect ourselves with proper respirators, which again is still not 100 percent protection, but it's a little extra something. So uh, before all of those are sold out, because that is entirely a possibility possibility as second waves come on uh yeah that's that's what i've done here yeah all right this is av rant the podcast that answers all your pandemic and <laughs> no we don't questions. we don't do that i, I we are not experts we on the pandemic i feel like i feel like that's what we do <laughs> we complain we do? about it for a little bit at the beginning and maybe scattered sporadically throughout but it is not the primary focus 
<laughs> right. The, we answer your AV and home theater questions. Mm-hmm. To get your questions answered, you, all you have to do is ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. That is the primary and uh, guaranteed way to get your question answered. If you do want any of the next things I say, maybe. Right. So, so you can go to avrant.com, leave us a comment mm-hmm. there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant, where the comments are turned off, so good luck. You can contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. I haven't checked my Tom at avrant ah, right. forever. <laughs> it is. Because I still haven't. It's a nightmare trying to switch it over from the Mac, and I, I literally don't want to get into it. I'm like, it's I'm too stressed <laughs> well, about everything. The else. longer you leave it, the worse it's going to be when you finally see it again. Oh, I, it, 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 I, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, and I think the I think the power block on my Xbox One blew up oh, yesterday. Yeah. So the Xbox, we had a power surge, which happens all oh, the time, yeah. but and nothing else is hmm. damaged. I mean, literally nothing else is damaged, and. Uh, you know, I come in here and my you know, we watch we're watching something and he's like oh I hate it I can't skip this ah. I said why can't you skip it he said because the Xbox doesn't work anymore I'm like when were you gonna tell me this I mean that should you should that's the first thing <laughs> that's a good thing so you got I, that Roku I, then <laughs> I know that's what we were using so uh, I did some research I think it's the power block mm. went bad so I ordered another one from Amazon and we'll see what happens when it comes in fingers and, crossed. Right. We will see. All right. I'm going to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you have to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link on the right side there, and that will take you to a PayPal donation site. We want to thank Dennis, Benjamin, and Chad for doing that this week. Thank you, gentlemen. Indeed, Dennis, Benjamin, and Chad, thank you so much for the PayPal donations. We appreciate it. We also want to thank our 125 125 patrons over at patreon.com up from 124 thank you for getting us back up to that that's right century mark like that uh patreon is a service that uh, allows you to become a ongoing subscriber to your content creators of choice if you choose us you can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month and a maximum of a million <laughs> billion trillion dollars a month see how many zeros can fit in there we won't mind just go my understanding is that if it's over a you know a, a, you know like five bucks or ten bucks or something like that they immediately take it out of your account ah. but if it's like one of those small amounts mm. then it's at the end of the month they'll it is pull it or beginning at the beginning month or yeah first of so, the month yeah yeah so 125 patrons over at patreon.com yeah patreon.com slash av rant podcast if you'd like to sign up uh think of it as a uh, automatic monthly donation and yeah it briefly ticked up to 126 at some point this moment and then came back down to 125 so there we are 125 as the as of the time of this recording (laughs) if you can't support us financially we completely understand but if you do something to support the podcast let us know what it is and we'll mention you so rs mentioned us to abt and AV Science when he bought his new TV and receiver. So thank you, Aris. Yeah, Aris, thank you very much for talking us up to... I think they actually do say apt. A- abd. A- a- it sounds like apt with a T, but it's a B. Abd. I think they say it that way. And AV Science. That's what, that I, call, that's what I call my ab, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's an abd. Abd. It's, I, I, other people have six-packs, I have a keg. Mm. I just think I'm doing it right. <laughs> I'm just going to do it right. Uh, we want to thank uh, some people who sent us some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going. Uh, you should actually thank the fact that we wear masks because that's <laughs> why we're keeping this podcast going because none of us are sick. So uh, Jack, uh, who says he's the, the two-hour-plus club for life, and he'd be a three-hour-plus club member if we decide to clear the topic list every week. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Yeah. Josh, who informed us that sadly he's no longer a staff writer for High Def Digest, but his Beyond 7.1.4 series will definitely live on, and he's working on creating a new site to host it, along with some uh, of his other home theater writing. Josh, I feel your pain. I remember what it was like when I stopped working for Audioholics. Mm-hmm. It was a dark days. And Alex, who sent a note or something, because there's nothing after his He name. did so, indeed. Jack, Josh, and Alex. Yes, thank you very much, Jack, Josh, Alex. We appreciate the uh, notes of gratitude and encouragement. Uh, we thank everyone for continuing to listen and sending in their questions and continuing to support this community and this podcast. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's very nice and encouraging, yeah. and thank you very much. On a personal note, as of Thursday of last week, I am corona-free. I went and got tested huh? because one of my kids, two of my kids were exposed to somebody who uh, we know mm. had it. Ah, man. Or has it. So I had to rush everybody down to the testing site, uh, and we got their results very, but within like 36 hours and mine mm-hmm. within 
48 okay. or so. So it was pretty quick. Uh, so as of Thursday, I, I am sure we are all clean here. So that's good. Good. In the news, news just broke after we finished recording last week. Disney is abandoning the theatrical release of the live-action version of Mulan, which I am really looking forward to. It looks good. I, <laughs> I, 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 I like Mulan mm-hmm. just fine. It's not one of my favorite Disney movies, but, uh, you know, I really like martial arts anything ah. <laughs> i'm really very excited about this so it was it was meant to be a summer blockbuster with a production budget of over 200 million dollars instead it will premiere on disney plus on september 4th but you can't watch it with just a regular disney plus subscription you have to pay 30 dollars at which point it will become available to watch as part of your existing disney plus subscription which means you can probably watch it infinity times at that that's point, right. right yes you Is can watch idea? it as much as you want if you pay the 30 dollars on september 4th or uh any time after that before it becomes part of regular Disney Plus. Right. Some news outlets are describing this as a premium video on demand rental. Other outlets are calling it a digital purchase, which is what it is. But it isn't really either of those things. At some point, Mulan would be added to the regular Disney Plus library. You would simply be paying an extra $30 to now unlock it early. Uh, Disney has said this is a one-time movie that only applies to this one movie at this one time, whatever. So... Yeah, I mean, you're not, yes, so you're not technically purchasing it, but Disney Plus, I, out of all the the services that are out there, Hulu, obviously Netflix is not going anywhere. Right. Hulu seems to be not going anywhere. The rest of them are all, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's it's like death race out there. It's like, you know, one of those. I mean, of all the one of, one-time it, purchase and rental places, you'd have yeah. to think Apple is probably the least likely to completely disappear at a moment's notice. Right. Right, but, uh, but Disney is pretty close up there. Disney is not going anywhere. No, they so. are really, really heavily invested in Disney+. Plus. Uh, I mean, this is an interesting move. Um, you know, when we first saw the $30 price point, because these other premium video-on-demand rentals that we've had previously have been $20, and I was like, $20 to me is honestly a pretty darn attractive price because, yeah. I mean, yeah. easily, as soon as you've purchased two tickets to go to the theater, $20 is probably less than that. Uh, but $30 is like, mm, that's a little questionable, but... This isn't the same as one of those rentals because it's not limited to 48 or 72 or 24 hours. Right. Uh, you can watch this right. as much as you want after you've paid the $30. Now, if you just want to wait, so I mean, you have to remember this is in lieu of the theatrical release. So if you right. just waited the normal amount of, like whenever Mulan was going to come to Disney Plus normally after the theatrical release, which I don't know whether that's nine months or a year from now, but that's still going to happen. You don't have to pay the $30. It will come to Disney Plus in whatever it is, nine months probably. Uh, but if you want to watch it now in lieu of a theatrical release, $30, I'm like, it's a little bit pricey if you really are only going to watch it once. It's certainly if you're alone and watching it only once, that's pricey. Right. But right. if this is something that you have kids and they might watch it repeatedly, that's not such a bad deal. I know there's a lot of families out there that are just desperate for any sort of new original content that you know they can get excited their kid their kids can get excited about and especially uh you know these kind of disney movies tend not to be watched just once by kids right. i am not doing this well, there's just no and if you were going to take a whole family to the theater you were going to spend more than yeah. 30 bucks so at that point that's oh, yeah. easy to justify yeah. right i mean if i take just one kid i'm spending more than 30 dollars right. because you got to popcorn and everything else that's going to go along with that so yes i uh, I, I agree I, I think that this is a, still a pretty good deal um i don't think that it's not like buying it uh, if i yeah. were if it were me i would wait for the disc to come out right. and i would buy the disc for yeah $30 because with rather than this, this you pay the 30 dollars, but if you ever stop your subscription to disney plus it's gone so it's it not like away. purchasing it on apple where you have right. that purchase even if you never buy another apple thing again um yeah. so yeah it, yeah it's not really a rental it's not really a purchase to me it's unlocking it early right uh, Disney won't be releasing any more catalog titles on Ultra HD Blu-ray, including the 20th Century Fox back catalog. New movies will still get a physical disc release after th- their theatrical run, but this is a clear step away from physical media and further towards making everything that Disney owns streaming only. So what are they doing, just Blu-ray? They're not going to do no, uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray? Well, so not Ultra HD Blu-ray. I don't know if there will be Blu-ray releases and DVD releases, but Ultra HD Blu-ray, definitely not uh, catalog titles. And I mean... A lot of Disney stuff was already out there, but Fox, there's a lot of Fox's back catalog that has never come to Ultra HD Blu-ray, and it won't Mm. be now. Um, So, yeah, it's it's a little bit disappointing for people who are collectors. Uh, I'm not... 
great, great. I mean, I know what they want to do. They want to have everything on Disney Plus, essentially, uh, and Hulu, since they now own that, um, so that, you know, you're constantly paying the subscription to watch it. But what I really dislike that they've already done is censored things. Uh, edited things, censored things on the service, and when there is no way of having the original version, <laughs> you're stuck right. with what they feed you. So that I'm definitely not a fan of. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. APC has discontinued all of their AV-centric battery backup models. The J and the S-Type series are no more. For the moment, the H-Type series of power conditioners remain, but they do not have battery backup. That's the one I have. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is not clear if any new models are planned as replacements, but an APC rep was recently on the CDM podcast describing how they are moving away from using stepped approximations of sine waves to either pure or smoother approximations of sine waves throughout the APC UPS uh, lineup. So there might be new models in the works. Mm. For the time being, the new uh, back UPS Pro gaming performance units look like the best replacement options. The model numbers are... BR1000MS, BR1350MS, and the BR1500MS. They offer six battery protected outlets and four surge only outlets, all with voltage regulation, but no high current outlets. They are all limited to 12 amps. So there you go. Yeah, they're pretty reasonable replacements. Uh, they're right around the same price as the J25 used to be. Uh, as the model numbers go up, it's longer and longer battery life and more and more wattage available from the battery. That's really right. all that's going on there. Uh, so yeah, very reasonable units, but but uh, don't have the high current 15 amp outlets. Okay. Well, I guess this is a warning here. Mm -hmm. TCL just announced their new six series TVs, the R635s. These look to take on Vizio's P series by offering a similar number of local dimming zones, but all at price points that are $300 less. They also have a 55 inch screen size while the Vizio P series starts at 65 inches, but there's a bit of marketing trickery afoot. TCL is promoting that this new six series is THX gaming certified, and that includes support for supporting variable refresh rate up to uh, 120 hertz, but that does not mean 4K at 120 hertz. <laughs> Vincent Tio from the HDTV test confirmed that TCL won't disclose the HDMI bandwidth, but he got them to admit that 4K 120 is not supported. So there's going to be a link in our show notes to that uh youtube yes video, I guess. yeah so um yeah i mean obviously it's a try everybody would love to have a less expensive uh version so if you're big into getting the playstation 5 and or xbox series x and you want all of the bells and whistles at the lowest price point um at the moment that's still going to be the vizio p series there is of course the vizio p quantum x series as well that has even more local dimming zones and gets even brighter but people were thinking oh maybe tcl is going to come in and undercut even vizio uh but it's not full 4K at 120, it's 1080p 120, or maybe even 1440p 120, we don't know for sure, but not 4K 120. So it is not the full HDMI 2.1 bandwidth, and uh, yeah, your best bet is still going to be that Vizio P series. Some comments here from listeners. James wanted to comment about the whole 12 amp versus 15 amp surge protection subject, noting that if you look at the power requirements of even flagship AV receiver models, the maximum current draw on a 120 volt line is typically under eight amps. So of course, an AV receiver is rarely uh, ever drawing maximum power. So perhaps the concern over having the full 15 amps is a little unwarranted. Well, I mean, if you have a uh, high power amplifier, though, like a monoprice monolith. Right, I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, subwoofer, subwoofer amps. Subwoofer, or, yep. Of some of those could be drawing a full 1,500 watts, 1,800. Well, it'll try to draw 1,800 watts. You won't get that much um, right. to the uh, just out of efficiency. But uh, yeah, th those can go crazy, crazy high. Although, uh, for the vast majority of people in the vast majority of circumstances, I do have to agree the chances that you're going to actually draw a full 15 amps uh, from from an outlet from one single device is pretty low. But nevertheless, since we have something as simple as APC's P8V that can do so very affordably, I still kind of say, why not if you're connecting an amplifier or a subwoofer? Right. James also wants to mention that he has had two, eight, well, he has had HDMI board rep, uh, boards repairs performed on two AV receivers now, an Ankyo and a Denon. And in both cases, even out of warranty, it costs considerably less than buying a, a comparable new model. In this case, both Ankyo and Denon had the him ship the units to an authorized repair center, and he had to pay a non-refundable assessment charge up front. This is in the UK, but that's pretty typical. It's like a hundred bucks. Just to, just to look at it, and then if you decide to go ahead with the repair, then that $100 right. 
comes off the price of the repair or I think that's the last time I had something yeah. repaired. That's what they, they had me do. So that's pretty typical. Uh, Nelson got back to us regarding his Marantz SR7010 that is, imme- is immediately going into protection mode. He wrote to Marantz and their support service replied with detailed advice. They tried to determine if the issue was internal or external. They had him completely unplug everything, then take the receiver to a diff- completely different room and plug it directly into a, the wall outlet. He also took our advice and gave it a thorough cleaning inside and out. It still goes into protection mode immediately. So Marantz said it's most likely an internal problem and servicing is required. Via an email, they cannot determine whether it's a full parts replacement of some kind or something small like just a loose wire or failed uh, so, uh, so, solder joint so, so, I always want to say solder <laughs> there is an L solder joint <laughs> but interestingly they had this to say if the unit does need service this is a quote here if the unit does need service, I, I would not pay to ship it to an authorized Marantz service center unless it is in warranty. If it's out of warranty, I would take it to any place in your local area that does TV or radio repair. Anybody with that skill set can safely open the unit and do an evaluation for you if, to give you an idea of what the cost of fixing will be. The reason I do not advise shipping the unit to an authorized retail uh, repair center is if the unit is out of warranty there may not be parts available to fix it and then you will end up paying for shipping both ways for a unit that still does not work when you get it back and Marantz does not own any repair shops they are all independent companies that we contract to do warranty work f- for us other than that there is nothing that separates a Marantz authorized service center from any other repair shop end quote so that's the situation in the U.S. yeah so, so th- I mean that was Nice information, very candid from Marantz. I was going to say, just, yeah, Marantz just bringing the bringing the real. Yeah, that's not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes there. So I appreciate that much. Uh, but at the same time, uh, both are indications that the cost of getting it repaired is very likely less than buying a whole, especially when you're talking like an X forty five hundred. You know that you know, high right, up right. in the lineup type of thing, uh, fully replaced, and that is going to be more expensive than the repairs. So uh, sounds like Nelson has done his due diligence for sure, and uh, servicing is uh, is going to be required on that one. All right, Andrew wanted to share some tips he learned about setting up his Harmony remote using a mono 2.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter cable to connect one of the ports on the back of his Harmony hub directly to the IR input port on this den receiver works perfectly. So that is confirmed. Yay. That is good. I was unaware that that would work, <laughs> but I'm glad to know that it does. Yeah. I got to remember to tell my, my parents have had more problems with their stuff mm. than anybody else has because of my mom's inability to allow things to be seen. So she keeps right. moving things back. Mm. <laughs> like, you got to leave the IR you blast need to work. You a line of sight for thing. infrared. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He already had a hub, so he bought a Harmony 950 and wanted to add it to the said hub. If he, if he tried to set up the 950 directly and then add it to his hub after the fact, it didn't work. What he had to do was begin the setup of the hub using the smartphone app and then pair the 950 remote to it, at which point the Harmony software recognized the new 950 plus hub combo as a Harmony Elite. Yeah. That's good. Order of operations. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> For Bluetooth devices like the NVIDIA Shield, the device won't recognize the Harmony's commands until you pair it, which is true of all these things. So in the Harmony software, you can go to edit, connectivity, repair, and then in the Repair, not repair. Right. Re- repair. Hi- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pair it again. Yes. And then in the Bluetooth device, you activate its Bluetooth pairing function, and now they work. They will work together. All of his. That's true for the PlayStation Three. Too. Yes. All of his devices are actually connected to his Wi-Fi network, so using the Harmony Hub's wireless network scan function made it super easy to add all of his devices, including his Philip Hue lights. So that's good. Uh, the new 2019 NVIDIA Shield models offer a button mapper function to assign specific apps to buttons that you might not use on the Shield's remote, such as volume up and volume down. So mapping those first and then programming the Harmony allows uh, him to have his, a single button push to launch his most used apps. So there you go. And there is already a dedicated Netflix button on that. So uh, if you have, right. say, three or four apps that you use on a frequent basis, now that the included remote with the uh, NVIDIA Shield has more buttons. Uh, the old one had like five buttons total, I think, <laughs> like including the up, down, left, right, and enter, or like six or seven buttons. It was not very many. But the new one has more, and some of them you don't always need. So yeah, that's cool. Button remapper. Right. All right, uh, let's see here. Let's get to the questions. Mm-hmm. Jules. For his whole house audio system, Jules bought a 16 channel Crestron branded of distribution amp off of eBay. It's rated at 60 watts per channel. He connected eight separate Chromecast audio devices. It's working well and sounds fabulous, but there's a bit of a problem. It's too loud. Mm. 
He is controlling the volume via the Chromecast audios themselves. There are no volume adjustments of any kind on the amp. He has never been able to turn the volume on the Chromecast audios higher than 10%. <laughs> and even with them set to the minimum of 1% before they go to bed, they're too loud when they come on in the morning. There was another eBay listing for an ADA branded 16 channel uh, amp that has only 45 watts per channel. Would that lower the volume for him or is there some other way to just tone down what he already has? You gotta be able to put a volume control in line here. It's got, there's got to be one, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I wanted to address the weather going to the ADA that is 45 watts versus the Crestron that is 60 watts that you have will lower the volume that you're hearing from the Chromecast audio devices. No. Uh, that yeah. will give you less headroom to turn the volume as high as the Crestron's volume could go. Uh, it will give you less headroom, but what determines the how how quiet it is at the low end of the volume scale is the gain um, that is applied to the input. So when you plug the Chromecast audio into the amplifier, the amplifier applies some voltage gain to that signal before then amplifying it. And it is that gain stage that determines uh, how strong the signal going to the amplifiers will be. And I looked up the specs and uh, they're essentially identical, but the ADA was uh, specified as being like 0.7 decibels louder in gain than the Crestron. So uh, at... At best, it would be exactly the same, and at worst, it would actually be even a little bit louder than your Crestron right. already is. So that is not a solution just because the uh, total number of watts is lower. That's the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so there are um, sort of like inline passive, they would call it an attenuator, because this is not an amplifier. It can't make the signal any louder, uh, but you can make the line level signal that comes out of the Chromecast and goes into the amplifier quieter. So it's just a little potentiometer uh, that you plug the cables in. Now, there is an inexpensive one. It's available on Amazon from CalRad. Uh, but the thing to know about it is the uh, the wires are actually kind of reversed from what you might think they are. Uh, the um, female leads where you might think you would plug your Chromecast into the female leads. Uh, no, that's actually the output. And it's the male leads that are the input to this little CalRad device. So you might need some adapter cables to get all of that connected if you went that way. Now, over at a company called uh, H-Labs, uh, they have a little uh, variable attenuator device, but it's about $25 each, and you've got eight of them to go with. Right. So it starts to add up, but there isn't anything that's a lot less expensive. The little CalRed one over at Amazon is like $16 each, which still kind of adds up, but it's not crazy. You can also get just fixed... Uh, RCA cable attenuators. Uh, in your case, I'm pretty sure you'd want to go for the 12 decibel ones. Uh, they come in six right. and three decibels, but I think you need more than that. You've got obviously plenty of headroom to work with. Uh, so you can just get little fixed attenuators, 12 decibel attenuators that go onto the RCA plugs. You can get those at Parts Express. But again, they're not super cheap. They're like $10 each, and you need two of them per device for left and right. So, so you might as well get the one that has the volume control. The volume on control, it. yeah. It actually is the least expensive. Although, if you end up needing a DAP after cables, then you kind of, it right. starts getting a little bit messy. The uh, the fixed attenuators are the cleanest in terms of install because you you just plug the normal plug into them and then you plug the attenuator directly into the amp. Right, but you have the least control over. You have the too. least control. All right, Terry. Terry went ahead and bought a pair of the monoprice amber in ceiling speakers with their folded ribbon treater. He has his four golden ear in ceiling speakers installed. And even with the mismatch, he really likes the results. Atmos sounds more impressive with a pair of speakers directly above his front row of seats, uh, as well as directly above the back row and the third pair out in front as front heights. So that's exactly what he wanted. Yay. Good. Yay. He's having some trouble with the Odyssey Editor app. He has his house wired up with the Google Wi-Fi mesh system, where and whether he tries uh, it with the Marantz SR6011 in his theater or the Denon X3400H that he has in another room, somehow the Wi-Fi connection gets lost at some point in the middle uh, of the Odyssey process, which means he has to start all over from the beginning, which is very tedious. <laughs> he has given up and just resorted to running the built-in Odyssey setup in the receivers, but like to be able to use the app. Uh, I have something to say about this because I've had the same problem. According mm -hmm. to the some signal strength test, he either has good or great Wi-Fi strength in both locations, and he's using an iPhone 11 Pro, Pro Max to run the app, which isn't showing any Wi-Fi problems. He's He has seen the odd mention of other people having Wi-Fi issues with the Odyssey Editor app, but nothing major. It doesn't seem to be a super common problem inherent to the app itself. 
So do we have this problem? Is it just him? Do the Morantz and uh, Denon receiver just not like mesh Wi-Fi systems? Do they really, or do they really uh, have weak Wi-Fi or something? What can he do? Um, my receiver is plugged in, is hardwired. Okay. So I do not have the issue that you're talking about as far as I'm using the Wi-Fi and the receiver and the Wi-Fi on my phone. Okay. But mm -hmm. I have found that uh, the first couple of times I tried to run Odyssey, I ran into the same problem. Oh, okay. And I determined it was because my phone was going into, uh, it was, was going to not sleep, but going, you know, the screen was Oh, just the screen going off. Okay. Yeah, the screen going off was enough to make this thing happen. Mm. So I I did all kinds of things, including moving the phone physically closer, which makes no sense. Mm. But, you know, I mean... I, That's you know, not at, where at the some signal point, from the phone is going. <laughs> I know. At some point, you start start getting very superstitious about these things. So I was like, maybe if the phone's closer, it'll work better. And it, the phone was closer, so it worked better. But it, was, it, it worked better because I think I kept walking back and forth to check it. Ah. Instead of just having it sit next to me on the computer when I'd forget right. about it and then it would, it would go black. And, and the so phone you were keeping it awake. I would use it. Yes. So that would be the ah. first thing I would try if I were you because that seemed to work for me. Okay. What do you got, Rob? Uh, well, yeah, because I haven't had this problem, but I have my phone set so that the screen never turns off unless I manually turn it off. So uh, I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, I haven't run into this problem. I only have one AV receiver uh, that is capable of using the Odyssey Editor app. So I wasn't sure. And I'm in an apartment, so I don't have great distances with my Wi Fi. Right. Certainly nothing that requires a mesh system. Um, so, I mean, you might suspect. I actually think your suggestion, Tom, is uh, that's 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 great because the only thing I was thinking is maybe there is something with mesh because you're kind of getting some channel hopping occasionally, and I was like maybe that's the interference. I actually suggested maybe if you're able to try plugging it in directly. He said he actually had some difficulty plugging it in with an Ethernet cable and then getting the phone to recognize it on the same Wi-Fi system. So I'm like, ah, do you have a, a complex network setup per chance, you know, yeah, over at Terry's maybe. place? Because, I mean, like with mine, if I plug something in with a wire to my router and then have uh, my phone or whatever connected by Wi-Fi to that same router, they, they see each other easily. They're on the same network. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Maybe his network's a little bit more complicated. That could have something to do with it. But I actually love your idea that it's, it's just the screen going to sleep and that's interrupting things. That, that seems probably like it's the ticket. Yeah. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on? <laughs> Dennis. Dennis once wanted to try out a projector in his living room, so he picked up a 1080p model. He also has a Samsung Q7 QLED, which is 4K and HDR, of course. At the moment, he is unplugging the HDMI cable from his TV and plugging it into the projector whenever he wants to use it. So he would like a simple way to switch. His Onkyo only has a single HDMI output, and he doesn't want to lose 4K and HDR for his flat panel. He tried a simple HDMI splitter and a different HDMI hdmi switch an image did get up here on both displays but he had to disconnect the 1080p projector in order to get the 4k hdr on the samsung <laughs> so those got returned any suggestions uh, it's uh hd fury or the other one that you suggest sure right? yeah so i mean an hd fury would certainly uh get this working although if you want so where an HD Fury would be, let's say, necessary, because the price is fairly high, um, is if you wanted to have both of these displays going at the same time. I don't right. think that's the situation he's in. But just in case your idea was, I want to have 4K HDR running on my flat panel and a 1080p version of the same source running on my projector at the same time, then you would need an HD Fury Vertex 2. Uh, that would be the least expensive way to do that because that's the one that can actually do full uh, like HDR reprocessing down into SDR at the same time that 4K HDR is still being fed through its other HDMI output. But... If you're doing them one at a time, you can do this uh, considerably less expensively. Uh, now, there's a couple of ways you can come at this. One, you could go with an HDMI uh, splitter that physically disconnects one display for the other when right. you switch between the right. two. So uh, Sewell has uh, what they call their Ibis Pro bi-directional switch, and uh, it is just a push button. So there are uh, two HDMI ports on one side and one on the other. You would be doing the output from your Onkyo to the single input on one side and then connecting both displays. And this physically disconnects one and then connects the other. That's the cheapest way to do it. It's about 35 bucks. But Sewell now has a new device Device that is called the Echo Split. And I love that they have this because this is now a less expensive alternative to HD Fury's AVR key. 
Uh, and this must be new, huh? I don't remember hearing this. About is that. quite new. Uh, you know what? I saw it a while ago, and then it went away, and now it is back. It is only fifty-five dollars. Again, it is one in, two out, but it's exactly what you're looking for. It's four K HDR on port number one, and ten eighty P only on port number two, and. You can't think of a more perfect solution for a more affordable price than that. 55 bucks, really not bad to do that. Mm. Okay. RS. RS by the floor display model, 77-inch uh, LG C9 OLED. Save him a lot of money versus a brand new one. It will be delivered for a week, and then he uh, he will have two weeks to evaluate it and decide if he wants to keep it or get a refund. So what test should he run to determine if it has any permanent image retention, dead or stuck pixels, or if it's defective in any way, including being dimmer than it should be. Um, like, put up a white screen, a gray screen, and a black screen <laughs> yep. to see what you can see. I mean, that's literally, I mean, I, I, I can't think of any other more accurate test than that, than just a, a black screen or a, a gray screen and a white screen. And if you don't see anything, then it's fine. <laughs> as <laughs> and, far as being dimmer than it should be, that, that would take a little bit. And more. you would want to get right up close because yeah. uh, we are talking 4K pixels, and even with a 77-inch screen size, they are tiny, and, uh, well, I don't know. On the one hand, if you view it from where you're going to be viewing it from and you yeah. can't spot any yeah. problems with the pixels, then maybe you don't want to find the one out of eight million pixels that actually is, like, black all the time, and now it's, like, the only thing you can ever look at. Uh, so <laughs> you might want to not torture yourself that way. But in any case, if you do want to see every single little pixel, you're going to have to get right up close. Now, um, thankfully... The LG OLEDs, uh, the built-in YouTube app in that television is fully 4K and HDR capable. Uh, and it's kind of hard to find that in external devices outside of, I think, the Chromecast Ultra might be the only solution. I think the, uh, the uh, PlayStation 4 Pro also is out of everything. But the built-in one directly in the, in the uh, OLED that you for sure are going to have uh, can do this. So I'm going to point you to three uh, places to get like every kind of test that you might possibly want. Um, the first one is just called, uh, what is it, the, uh, the HDR channel. So the HDR channel on YouTube has an actual HDR test uh, that is their brightness stress test. And that'll put up at five seconds each um, intervals of, I think it's good, 100, 200, 400, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, or something like that nits. Uh, so yeah. if your screen gets progressively brighter... Uh, as those tests are going along, then it's showing you everything that uh, HDR should look like. I mean, if your screen is 600 nits instead of 700, I don't know how you'd ever know that without a meter, but if you can see the right. difference in each of those as the uh, brightness level in the signal goes up, then your TV is working properly as far yeah, as... it's not going to get to 4,000. Well, though, definitely sure. no, it's not even going to get to yeah. 1,000 on an OLED, but yeah. it will be tone mapping. The TV will be tone mapping. So if you can still see the difference, then everything is working great. Uh, now, if you want to check for individual pixels, make sure there's no stuck pixels, no burn-in, um, no black pixels, uh, no stuck white pixels, then... Uh, uh, TV Calibration with Darko is the U uh, YouTube channel. He has a really, really good test uh, called Patterns for OLED Uniformity and Burn-In Check. Almost sounds like exactly what you want, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> what I like there is he actually puts up labels and shows uh, all the primary and secondary colors and uh, different versions of gray uh, at varying intensity levels, which actually can be important when you're trying to check for burn-in because they don't always show up at just 100%. Sometimes it's when you're showing it at 25 or 50% or something that you actually see it. So really good test patterns there. And finally, if you just want to put up a solid color, for because the ones that uh, in the darko test patterns you can pause them of course uh but if you right. don't want to mess around with pausing and moving back and forth in the video uh there's a channel just called uh 10 hours of uh pictures for 10 hours i think it's the name let me see yeah pictures of stuff for 10 hours <laughs> picture is the okay. uh is the name of the channel pictures of stuff for 10 hours including solid colors for 10 hours at a time you won't have to press pause there you go so some people said he should check how many hours the TV has been used. How does he do that? And how many hours is too many hours? <laughs> um, well, it's inside almost all of these. Uh, I know my projector is this way. There'll be something like about yep. or something along those lines. you know. And you go look for that and it'll tell you how many hours it has on it. Um, most of these TVs or you know, everything should have like a, a rating as far as you know, it's sort of half life yeah. or, you know, what its life is. And the life of a TV 
if I remember correctly, is when it, it loses half of its brightness. Yes, half of its initial fresh out of the box brightness. So that's you're looking to see how far how close you are to that. And if this is a floor model and it was on twenty four seven for the last couple of months, well then you may have gone through quite a bit of that. Could be. I I, I, I would look for that, but uh yeah, I don't know what this. T- Did he say what TV it was? And yeah, I, of it's course, uh, yeah, the C9 LG OLED. C9. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure Rob knows the number of hours or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, Tom was right. Uh, there is a section called about this TV. If you just go into the uh, regular settings, there is a general tab, and under the general tab is about this TV. And that's where it lists how many hours the TV has been in operation. Uh, now, OLEDs, uh, their half-life is rated at 20,000 hours. Uh, so it's a pretty good long lifetime, but 20,000 hours is is uh, sort of accepted as the half-life of for OLED TVs. And one thing to be aware of is at the 4,000-hour mark, there is a, they call it like a, a full refresh cycle of the whole panel where uh, it actually does like a sort of a scraping white pattern for several hours and it's uh, sort of does like a, a change in the um, in the lookup tables inside the TV. You don't have any control over it. It's done automatically, but it's at the 4,000 hour mark that that happens. Uh, so the sort of consensus in my general feeling is if it's gone beyond 4,000 hours or it's getting really close to it, I would sort of expect that that TV to be like half price, if not less. Um, Cause that, that large refresh cycle means that they're like fully updating the lookup tables in the panels for me, like 2000 hours or less, the TV is essentially new uh, as far as an OLED goes. So if you're right around 2000 hours or less, then uh, I think you got a good deal. If you're closer to 4,000, eh, maybe ask for an even bigger discount. <laughs> All right. Art. Art took advantage of the 50% off uh, sale that Best Buy was running on TCL 8 series TVs. It got the 75 inch. Uh, it's replacing a 55 inch Panasonic Plasma. His in- in- Integra receiver and HDMI cables are all version 1.4. So at some point, he's prepared to uh, inevitably upgrade his receiver and HDMI cables. But for now, his sources are PS4 and Apple TV 4K, along with the streaming apps built into the TCL via the Roku interface. He's using a 5.1 BW satellite system for the speakers. So the, is that the, the old TV? image that's, is the old, the old TV, TV. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. but it's to give an idea inches. of the uh, <laughs> cleanliness of his setup and to see the BNW M1 satellite speakers that he is using. I've, I've been in the house that had these speakers. Mm-hmm. I was so angry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, like one was right next to the TV and uh, one I was see. like on the side wall. <laughs> that is not the case like... for art. Arts are set up in no, a arts, perfectly arts acceptable way. I might pull them forward because it looks like they're recessed they're on the right, credenza yeah, below right the TV. But uh, in terms of left, center, right positioning, they're very much acceptable. <laughs> so since his new TV will be wall mounted in, in place of his plasma, who preferred to be able to connect all of his sources to an AV receiver so that he would only need a single cable running to his TV. So what should he upgrade first in order to take advantage of his new TV? Uh, well, the one point four receipt. What has he got? Integra. Do we know if it has uh, audio return channel? Um. Okay. So I looked up the model that he mentioned in his email. In the specs, when it originally came out, it actually said it was HDMI version one point three, which did not have uh, audio return channel. No, I don't know if there ever was. An update, an update if it was possible to update i i don't know the situation on that so to play it safe there's a very real possibility he does not have audio return channel because uh it, when it originally came out it was definitely version 1.3 now he could of course run an optical cable which would give him in his case since he's just got a 5.1 audio system anyway cable. but he wants one he wants one cable. he wants one cable yeah right so uh to take advantage of what you have right now, mm-hmm. you have to run a second cable. You run the optical cable from your TV back down to the receiver so that you can get the audio from the apps. That's right. Okay? That's that's if you don't have audio return channel. Mm-hmm. If you have audio return channel, then you can turn audio return channel. You won't get full lossless. You'll get you know Dolby Digital or something like that, but uh, you won't get the full the full lossless on right. there. Uh, but you could use that. That would be your one cable. So what do you have to upgrade if you want to get the full experience and plug everything into the to the receiver and get 4k and yeah hdr yeah. and all the goodness yeah you gotta upgrade every, everything <laughs> you t- there's still, well, there's no there's I, I don't know that uh, depending on the length of the run uh getting full 4k and everything else with a legacy yeah hdmi cable 
is going to be very much a, a crapshoot and probably not possible. But uh, I don't see any... But the, the, the upside is that if your receiver is right below it, which is where it looks like it is, this is not an expensive purchase. Yeah, so this I'm... Is, well, uh, I think he the, actually says it's in a, in a closet about 20 feet away in his next question. It is so. an expensive purchase, yes. Yeah. It will be an expensive purchase. So, I mean... Uh, so, the thing is, if you have any external 4K sources, any... Um, yeah. To have the full 4K HDR video, you would have to plug them directly into the TV. And I don't think he wants to do that in any circumstance. No. Um, no. I mean, maybe if it's something like a Roku stick where you really wouldn't see it, it'd just be you know sure. plugged directly into the back of the TV or an Amazon Fire stick. Uh, that that could I could see working that way. But even if it's like an Apple TV 4K, that's not really something that's going to dangle off the back of the TV. And if it's an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, you could do the thing where... Um, you are uh, like plugging just the video into the TV and just the audio from the second audio output uh, into the AV receiver. But again, you'd have a cable going from the player to the TV. So right. I'm not sure that that's what he wants to do. Um, so I'm sure it's not what he wants to do. No, no. So <laughs> the, uh, the first thing that you would need to... Uh, need to get as an AV receiver and then almost certainly a new HDMI cable as well. That that would be the, the place to start with your upgrades. There's no there's really no getting around this. So this is the problem. Using the cable in the wall, especially if it's a twenty foot long cable, then you end up with bandwidth limitations, which means you're not gonna get four K or eight maybe maybe not even maybe not four K, certain maybe not HDR, maybe you'll get one, maybe you'll get both. Uh Dolby Vision, all that stuff is probably going to be right out, uh, and and you won't be able to get. If you get the new, if you get a new receiver, your cable might be able to send uh, the audio back, the audio return channel back, depending on which cable you installed when you installed it. Uh, could possibly work that way, but there is no getting around. You have to replace both these things if you want to have one cable and take full advantage of your TV and, and plug everything into the receiver. That way you can use your apps. You can use the eARC to send back your full, uh, you know, lossless whatever audio. So you get the full lossless from your apps. You get the, the full video signal going to the TV from your sources at the receiver's end. Uh, there's no really, there's no real way around this, unfortunately. There's no, there's no workaround yeah. that doesn't involve... Uh, you running more cables in the wall and in this case it would be cheaper to buy the receiver and another cable than it would be to buy a splitter and then or you know two cables one to the receiver one to the the <laughs> for the video for all of your sources i mean you're looking at at least three or four cables at that point right. hdmi cables which is the cost of a receiver so you know <laughs> uh, uh, at that point you just might as well just buy the receiver so his current uh, Integra receiver is in the closet, as Rob mentioned. Uh, so the HDMI cable that runs to the TV is 20 to 25 feet long. Is that too long for an HDMI 2.0 cable? It is not. What is the maximum length for an HDMI 2.0? And does he need to worry about 2.1 at all? Uh, it doesn't sound like you're going to need to worry about 2.1. Because what does that add really? Is the the variable refresh rate? Yeah, and 4K 120 or 8K. Right. Um, so, I mean, unless you're planning to very soon replace the TCL 8 series that you just bought, and I don't think that's right. the case, uh, then you don't need to worry about HDMI 2.1. I mean, at some day, you probably will, but yeah. I I'm assuming yeah. you intended to keep this brand new 8 series TCL for some amount of time. Uh, so that one is HDMI 2.0. Don't need to worry about 2.1. Um, now, as far as the length of the run, if you're going with a passive, uh, so what you're looking for is a high speed premium HDMI cable. You can certainly just get it from Monoprice or Blue Jeans. Uh, but as ter in terms of a passive one, I probably wouldn't go beyond 15 feet. 15 yeah. feet is about the max I would feel comfortable for a passive HDMI cable. But for 20 to 25 feet, you could definitely get an active uh, HDMI 2.0 cable. Uh, once you go beyond 50 feet, I would probably transition to fiber optic, but 20 to 25 feet, I'd go active. Now, I trust Blue Jeans Cable's uh, Series 3A active cables pretty much implicitly, so that is almost certainly what I would point you to where they are not overpriced. And uh, yeah, that that's the way I would go. You could also go Dynamic View from Monoprice. Those are also very good and very close in price. Uh, for those of you listening to the podcast in headphones, you may be hearing 
thunder that ah. is my house it is rumbling like it's almost noon yep. uh, in florida which means it's gonna rain and while we're it on will, the topic of uh things glitching my my camera completely froze for the uh not for the skype chat but for the oh. uh for the obs video so i'm gonna I'm, say you're moving fine on my side yeah trying to see if i can fix that but for now i'm a logo enjoy <laughs> nah so this is from anonymous we haven't had an anonymous question in a while so Anonymous has been using a Chromecast audio in their phone to stream music from Tidal and Spotify to their home audio system, but sometimes the internet connection seems to get lost and interrupted. A week later, it turned out that it was the Chromecast audio's uh, power cord, so it's actually fine, but nonetheless. Would there be any advantage in terms of sound quality to getting a dedicated network streaming device? The max budget is 400 bucks. Uh, so you're streaming it to a Chromecast, right? So the Chromecast... The way that Chromecast works is it's not the, the, the direction you think it is. It, it does not go from the internet to your phone, and your phone sends it to the Chromecast. That's not the way that this, is, this works. So the way it works is it goes, you go on the internet with your phone, and you say, I want to stream this, and you say, send, you know, cast it to the Chromecast. And the Chromecast says, what do you want to watch? Oh, yeah, you want to watch that? And it goes and grabs it from the internet and start streaming it. That's why you can turn your phone off and then it'll keep going and it'll be fine. So uh, the question that becomes, what uh, is the best uh, bandwidth that you can get? What's the best the the, the throughput of, of data that you can get? Is the Chromecast the best or is there another device that's better? If you could get a device that you can hardwire, that would be preferable to a Chromecast. Uh, it might be harder to operate, but it would be preferable. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't. But the sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say I don't think it's really a uh, an issue. Um, you know, continuing to use the Chromecast audio if you found what mm -hmm. the real problem was. I mean, the thing is, yeah. the Chromecast audio. Well, as we heard earlier on, uh, its uh, line level signal output is actually probably higher than some of the devices. Um, that's not the problem. And and actually, I know for a fact that the Chromecast audio, uh, in terms of its analog audio output, has uh, remarkably low noise. Like it was a it yeah. was a surprisingly well made little device. So uh, yeah. the chances that you're going to get significantly better audio quality. Uh, just in terms of two-channel stereo, really, really low. That said, there are some devices that will accept uh, audio formats from certain services. I'm particularly thinking of Tidal, that the Chromecast audio doesn't necessarily support. And specifically, I'm talking about the highest res version of Tidal with Atmos audio. Right Now, if yours is a two-channel only system, then we're really not going to worry about that, are we? <laughs> uh, but if you wanted to do that, uh, the device I would actually point people towards these days is the Amazon Fire TV Cube. Um, okay. That Amazon Fire TV Cube supports the very highest level of, uh, of Tidal audio, including Atmos audio. At the moment, Amazon Music HD is still only offering Atmos audio uh, via their Echo Studio speaker. But if and when they start offering it to a regular home service, you can be pretty sure that the Amazon Fire TV Cube is going to be the first device to get it. Um, and right. then as far as a Spotify playback device, it's it's very, very good as well. And then it also has She Who Shall Not Be Named uh, built right into it. So if you ever lose the remote or don't have your phone handy on you, you can just talk to the thing and get your music playing that way. So I actually really like the Amazon Fire TV Cube as a streaming audio device. The one little hiccup there is, so in first of all, in the box, it comes with an Ethernet adapter. So if you do want to go hardwired, you have that ability uh, right out of the box. And then... Um, the output of it is HDMI. And I'm mm. thinking if you have a two-channel only system, most two-channel only systems still today don't have HDMI inputs. Right. So you'd right. be looking for something that can turn the HDMI signal into uh, a regular RCA or perhaps optical uh, signal because sometimes you have that. Well, once again, Sewell comes to the rescue because Sewell has uh, an HDMI audio extractor called the Siphon. Uh, that has really, really good specifications as far as very, very low noise uh, on the analog output section and a uh, very reasonable price for the uh, Sewell Siphon. What is that? $35. So you get that along with an Amazon Fire TV Cube, and I think you got a really good streaming audio setup. So if you're not going multi-channel channel audio, just stick with what you got. And if right. you do want to go multi-channel channel audio, you're going to be end up paying a bunch of money or... 
Okay. The dog is now in here because she is upset. <laughs> she is upset with what oh, was is that, going on. That was thunder. Okay. I finally heard that, some of the thunder you've been talking about. It's the first your time. Your microphone just changed. You changed microphones. I almost certainly did. Hold on. In my recording, it's fine. In my Skype, I'm sure it changed. The recording <laughs> was, is fine. It, it, That's the important The thing, thing. is that the, the thunder went and then suddenly you got <laughs> echoey. And I'm like, what is going on? So, yes, we are getting a bunch of thunder. So the dog has been let into this room so that she can sit on the couch and stare at me, wondering why I'm not over there helping her. What are you doing? Uh -uh. <laughs> it's you always sit. fun technical times at AV Rant. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to our next question here. Uh, Tony. Tony is replacing a 60-inch... <sighs> okay, now she wants to get out. Uh-huh. Hold on a second. Let me read this question and then, not, All then right. I'll go let I her think out. I think my microphone should be fixed. You got your mic fixed, <laughs> yeah. yes. I see you. Come here. C come to the other side. Come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Come here. You know what, folks? Uh, you know, I, I think we've done a pretty consistent job here on AV Rant throughout all this pandemic. I mean, if you watch all the late night shows and everything, uh, everybody is uh, is doing wackier stuff than we are. I think it's time that we, uh, yeah. we we take a little aside and recognize that not everything is perfectly normal. And hello to uh, to your lovely little dog, Violet, Violet. there. Yes. Violet's going to sit with me for a second while she calms down. <laughs> All right, Tony. Whoop, no, she goes. She's calm again. <laughs> <laughs> Tony has scared away the doggy. Tony is replacing a 60 inch plasma, and it's important that the new TV be as large as possible because the person who will be watching this TV is most, uh, the most, is legally blind. The budget is around three grand. Should you consider the very affordable uh, $1,900 86 inch LG UN8500 LCD TV, or would it be generally worth it to spend more for a different? model all right you answer that and i'm gonna go do i shall so i will say so this is one man's opinion but uh i really would not recommend uh lg's lcd tvs uh, unfortunately i would have to say full stop um they just they don't have uniform backlights uh lg exclusively uses ips lcd panels which means inherently their contrast and their black levels are just not as good uh you're talking 1000 to 1 contrast which is not a high number for tvs these days um just your standard vertically aligned panel that say samsung or sony for the most part is using uh will have at least about 4000 to 1 contrast and then they have local dimming on top of that so the uh the lg i mean very attractive price point i can't argue with that but i just don't think the image quality is there where i can feel good about recognizing it now thankfully there is an 85 inch tv that i can really quite wholeheartedly recommend and that is sony's x 900 h um, now, it has full array local dimming, although not a tremendous number of zones. Uh, so we're not talking about itty bitty tiny zones that really, really up the contrast and black levels that way. But Sony's algorithms that they're using for their local dimming and reducing haloing and that are really quite good. Uh, what I like about Sony is they always maintain the shadow detail. And then it's just a very good television overall is the Sony X900H. We do know that Vizio's P Quantum X, which will be the only series they have with an 85 inch size on offer. It is gonna be coming out. It's expected in September. Um, the price point is actually right at $3,000 for the 85 inch. So it, it hits all of those targets it will be brighter than the Sony X900H. There's really no question about that. However, some of the early previews, and we can't really know for sure because these were like pre-production models that got sent out to one or two reviewers in advance. Uh, there were some issues with how the backlight was being handled where it wasn't just the normal halo of light around little bright objects. It was like scattering color around little bright mm. objects and it was really quite noticeable and i don't know if it's something that's going to be fully fixed in the full production models or if this is an issue that vizio is having this year so it's a bit of a wait and see but if you want to buy one right now i can really quite wholeheartedly recommend the x900h from sony there you go chad Chad wants a new TV for his well-lit living room. Due to his viewing distance, he would really, really like as long a screen as, po uh, screen as possible within his $4,000 budget. What would we recommend? Chad, rewind about three minutes of this podcast. That is a C above answer. Yeah, um, yeah it's going to be that Sony X900H. <laughs> All right. Chad's dad also wants a new TV, and he is really hung up on getting 8K because he's going to sit on the TV as he watches it. 
He's going to be, he's going to use the TV as a chair. He's going to actually have two of them and use them for eyeglasses. Mm. He wants a 75 inch size and he's currently leaning towards the Sony Z8H. He does not like Samsung as a brand. He doesn't want to consider them. (laughs) (laughs) Racist sounds racist to me, but whatever. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know anything about your dad, but geez. Just discount an entire brand out of hand. I've had some really good luck with Samsung. I have a Samsung dishwasher, which I like. I have a Samsung uh, refrigerator, which I like. I've had Samsung tablets, which have just been fine. They're from Korea. I like Korean food. He had a bad Uh, experience. I won't question it too much. (laughs) Killed his dog or something. So is the Sony the 8K TV to get, or would we recommend something else? I would recommend a 4K TV to start with. I mean, honestly, Chad, I I don't know if perhaps you can get your dad to listen to to our answer here. Um, Maybe you should should fast forward past that last little bit. (laughs) Don't don't let him listen to that far. Unless he's good humored, which we hope so. Uh, But no, honestly... I really, really want to stress this because, okay, um, do you just want to have more pixels so that you can say you have more pixels? Or do you want the best looking image quality that is available to purchase today? Because right. those two things are not one and the same right now. Well, I guess that's right. if he's got $20,000 to spend, you could get LG's 77-inch um, 8K OLED. It is $20,000. That is their right. Z10, the ZX model. That does exist. I don't think he was looking to spend $20,000. No. I will say this flat out. The 77-inch OLEDs, 4K resolution OLEDs from LG, are superior in image quality in every single way to the current 8K LCD televisions at the 75 inch screen size. Uh, That is just full stop. Whether you're talking sharpness, because if you're thinking the higher resolution, it must look sharper. No, the 4K OLEDs look sharper than the 8K LCDs because there is more to visual sharpness than just the pixel count. Um, That's right. The contrast is Especially when there's no 8K native content to map it to. There's not that. So everything's everything's got to be even if there were um the 4k oled still looks sharper because the the edges of each pixel are better defined in the oled but the contrast pixel beside pixel you can have full black next to full white on the oled you cannot do that on the lcd think about the number of local dimming zones on the lcds hasn't changed but you quadrupled the number of pixels it doesn't look right. any sharper you had the blooming is actually somewhat worse the let through amount of light on the 8ks is lower than the 4k lcds so you either have to pump the backlight even more which actually makes your black levels and contrast worse or the whole image is dimmer there is no metric of visual appearance on a television where a 4K OLED is not superior to an 8K LCD. I, well, the 8Ks, the TVs that they're putting out, I mean, they're basically just shoehorning this 8K uh, <laughs> panel into well, I mean, an existing 4K box. In the case of Samsung, you aren't actually even seeing 8K all at once. Uh, you're getting half of it at a time. So uh, I, I don't know... If there's any way to convince you, I hope there is, because in every single way, a 4K OLED is what you should get here. And if you really completely don't believe me, one, look at all the reviews on all the 8K televisions on YouTube, because every reviewer is mentioning this. And then if you still don't believe any of us, just please see it for yourself. Go down to a Best Buy, look at an OLED, and look at one of these 8K displays, and you will see for yourself that the OLED looks superior in every single way. Do not worry about the 8K number versus the 4K number. My guess is that if it's not just the raw number that's that's encouraging him, then it is somebody at a Best Buy or someplace similar saying this is the latest and greatest. Let me tell you something about the latest and greatest Chad's dad. <laughs> uh, especially with brand new AV technology, the first to market often you know uh, gets to ride that wave of people purchasing just based on the number. 
and that don't really care about how it looks. So you get things like what we have right now, which is AV receivers that have one output that is can be used for your 8K display. Now, you right. can use all the rest of them. <laughs> you can use the other ones, right? It, but it won't be able to pass through the full everything it's supposed to, which doesn't really do you any good because you can only have one input for your, your 8K sources and you can have to keep switching them manually or buy some sort of <laughs> external switch, which defeats the whole purpose. The technology, first of all, is unnecessary. I think if you listen to this podcast for any length of time, you will find out that you know if you can't see a pixel, it doesn't matter how small that pixel is <laughs> when, when you're not seeing the edges of the pixel. So where you're going to be seated from this TV if you can't see the pixel at 1080p, you're not going to see it at 4K, and you're not going to see the 8K. And honestly, you're not going to be able to tell that much of a difference between them. So what you're really looking for is everything other than the size of the pixel. What is the best contrast? What is the best brightness? What is the best, you know, color accuracy? What is the best uh, black levels? Picture, HDR black levels. Con yes. uh, smoothness uh, of the image, like a of, flicker and blur right. and all of those. Like blur I said, is the thing I would worry about. I'm telling you right now, man. You like to watch sports? No. Do not <laughs> go for an OLED. 100%. Like I say, every metric, it, every yeah. single metric, the OLED is better. I, 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 I don't know how to stress it enough to convince you. I hope yeah. there's a way. If only thing you care, care about is the pixel count, then right. knock yourself out by whatever you want. You don't need our help. And if, but if what you want is the best possible display, then you should buy an OLED. And if you're thinking about the latest and greatest for, I don't know if it's gaming or if you just, you just want, you're just a person who loves tech and you want to have the latest and greatest, the LG OLEDs, the C10, or you know what? For the price point that you were considering, you could get the G10. Like the, the picture quality is no different versus the C10 or G10, but the the physical design of the G10, I'm like, oh my God, is that an amazing TV? Because uh, mm. it's almost the wallpaper, but not the wallpaper with the stupid sound bar. It's like, a, it's a gorgeous TV, the G10. So mm. if you're going to wall mount the thing, definitely consider that because you're going to afford it with the price point you were looking at. Um, but if you want the latest and greatest, they have the full spec HDMI 2.1. So they've got the fullest spec as far as the tech goes. It's literally just the pixel count. So please, please get the 77-inch OLED, I beg of you. So for these new uh, HDMI 2.1 TVs, whether it's 8K or 4K 120, the new HDMI cables are needed, correct? Mm -hmm. But Chad contacted Blue Jean Cables, and they said the official ultra-high-speed HDMI cables aren't even available yet. That is true. That is true. The official <laughs> certification. So the, the, the final specification has been done, but the certification process for the cables is not up and running yet. Right. So basically, you can make a cable that can do the right. thing. But you can't get it tested and get the stamp of approval. Get the little that hologram says sticker. You can't get that yet. That's right. Yeah. So in his dad's case, he wants to run a new HDMI cable inside his wall so that it can handle 8K. And Chad was even thinking it might be a good idea to run at least two new HDMI cables plus some Cat 6. But how long can ultra high speed <laughs> HDMI cables be? And if an official one doesn't exist yet, what should he get? Well, I bet you could call back Blue Jean Cable and say, well, if I was going to install one of yours in the wall and it was going to be this sure. long, I wanted to make sure it can do all the things, they will tell you which one will do the thing, and it will do the thing. Uh, guaranteed. I mean, because that's Blue they would certainly tell you to get their, their biggest, heaviest, uh, fullest yeah. uh, Series 1 cable, but uh, even that... Uh, crazy honking hose of a cable as far as 18 gigabits per second HDMI 2.0 goes uh, was only fully, cer fully certified up to 25 feet um, at that. So for ultra high speed with the 48 gigabits per second that'll be tested for, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the Series 1 will pass it, but at what distance? I'm not sure. It won't be 25 feet. So right. Monoprice does have, uh, so for the moment, since they can't get the full ultra high speed certification and the hologram sticker just yet, they are calling it their 8K 48 gigabit per second HDMI cables. They almost certainly will pass the certification once it exists. So I don't have a huge problem saying that it's okay to buy them now, but <laughs> this is almost hilarious. The passive ultra high speed cables that they have are only three feet maximum because that's as long oh, as they could make a passive <laughs> 48 gigabit per second HDMI cable. They do have their active dynamic view, 8K 48 gigabits per second cables, uh, but the maximum length is eight feet for an active 
4K HDMI, or 8K HDMI cables. So, yeah. if you're talking about going in a wall, I'm betting it's going to need to be longer than eight feet. Uh, right. The only option that exists right now that is like tested to pass 48 gigabits per second are the fiber optic ones. And you're talking, right. so the shortest one they make is 10 feet and it's $190. Now, thankfully being monoprice, they don't go insane with the extra length because you're just talking about extra fiber optic at that point. The expensive part are the chips on either end that are doing the right. conversion because to do full HDMI 2.1, those are expensive. So, uh, you know, you're talking like 200 $220 for the sort of 25 foot length, that type of thing. Uh, but that's kind of what you're talking about. Now, those fiber optic ones from on a price are not in wall rated for just their jacket that's included. So they would have to be run inside of a proper fire blocking conduit uh, for the in wall rating as far as fire safety code goes. I would suggest running an HDMI in wall cable inside of a conduit anyway. But if you don't already have a conduit in the wall, that that means opening up the wall. You can't just like fish a conduit through uh, right. a wall. So this could be a not trivial thing. And if you are going to open up the wall and put conduit, then by all means, include some CAT6 cables, definitely. Uh, but if you're going to get two of these HDMI fiber optics in there, you're talking probably about 500 bucks. Right. And if it were me, I would just put some string <laughs> through oh, it. Oh, include it so in that the conduit. I could, yeah. I, I could, yeah, I would fish... Yeah, you know, so I could pull another pull HDMI another cable HDMI. if I needed it. I would not, and I would not put one in there and just have, leave it dangling just in case. Um, you're almost certainly never going to use it. I ran to my projector uh, component video and HDMI, and I have never, uh, ever <laughs> used the component video. Know. I don't even think it's possible anymore. <laughs> I don't know what's on the back of my receiver anymore. But uh, yeah, I would just run the the straight thing. So you you, you see what we're getting here, right? I mean. Uh, to go to 8K just for the sake of going to 8K, you're going to be running into some issues right. that are not insurmountable. They're just what they are. But that said, I mean, we even... haven't we we haven't even gotten to the, his last question, which is just going to yeah. It's just going to add another one. So let, let's do that. And then that we'll said, up even, the end. even with the OLED, uh, if we're talking about the C10 or the G10 OLED, if you do want the 4K 120 support, yeah. then that is an HDMI 2.1 uh, ultra high speed cable necessary for that as well. So the cable might be necessary either way that you go, but, but please get the OLED. That's if his dad's playing on a, what xbox series x or playstation yeah. 5 yeah. i mean that's you you if he's not doing that then you don't need the one or a upcoming anyways. 3000 series uh nvidia graphics card because they'll have hdmi 2.1 as well right. again in his dad's case his av receiver and sources are together in a rack while the tv is wall mounted with with a clean look and an hdmi cable is inside the wall so would he also need to upgrade his receiver to a model that supports hdmi 2.1 <laughs> They don't exist, but yes. Well, no there's if, the dead ends and the Marances with one they input. They don't exist. One input. They don't exist. <laughs> they don't exist. That's not a, a solution. And if we don't have actual 8K sources, and the main concern is upscaling 4K sources, can HDMI 2.0 receiver with a, an 18 gigabits per second HDMI cables be sufficient? Um, well, if you want all, if you're going for the 8K, you, you kind of want to have all the stuff. So yes, there is no 8K native sources, and yes, scaling will be involved. Mm -hmm. But your TV is going to be perfectly capable of scaling 4K to 8K. Oh yes. I mean, it's it's that's not that is not going to be the bottleneck for the, the, what's going on here. Uh, so you will be sending out uh, 4K, and I don't know that there is a 2.0 receiver. Is there a 2.0 receiver with yeah 18 gigabits? I was. Oh, 18 gigabits, sure. 18 gigabits, yeah. So I would, yes. That's everything. I, the current receivers that have HDMI 2.1 have a single HDMI 2.1 input. That's right. And that's it. Yeah. So, so they are not a switch. You know, they're not a switch. You can only put one thing mm -hmm. in there. Everything else is going to have to go into an HDMI 2.0. Yeah. So at that point, why are you even spending the extra money for it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you gotta. I I don't even consider it an actual solution. I mean, as I clearly say that at the beginning. For literally everything other than the PlayStation Five and Xbox Series X and the next generation of graphics cards, for everything else, an HDMI 2.0 receiver with your regular 18 gigabits per second HDMI inputs is fine. Uh, and if you are okay, like let's say you're on, you're gonna get one of the new systems, but only one of them, and you're okay with plugging it directly into the TV 
then that is also fine because you can use enhanced audio return channel to send the audio from the TV back downstream, including through the fiber optic HDMI cable right. if you do go through it because uh, they do support eARC on those uh, monoprice fiber optic ultra high speed cables. And so, you know, as long as you're okay with plugging the 4K 120 or 8K source directly into the TV, you don't need to upgrade the receiver. But but he's not going to do that because it's because it's the unclean look. If 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 the yeah. source, including just one of the new game systems, is going to go in that equipment closet, then yeah, you'd need a new AV receiver. There's no way around it to to pass 4K 120 and 8K signals through. Uh, but regardless, wait because none of those game systems or next generation graphics cards exist yet. Um, if you aren't in line to get one immediately, there, there very well might be months long delays. We're expecting that in fact. So once you have the game system in hand, then maybe consider getting the new AV receiver uh, and definitely keep an eye out on how close we are to ones that have HDMI 2.1 switching at that point. Yeah. yeah. Jack. Jack is fairly new to Plex. He decided to give it a try since he has an older PC that he could leave on all the time as a Plex server. And then he has Roku devices throughout the house that he can use for playback. He has put some DVD box sets into his Plex library to start and it's all functioning, but he basically left everything at default. So he gets the sense that it could be optimized to look a little slicker and run a little smoother. Can we point him to some good resources, in particular things like guides for the best ways, uh, way to name his files and advice for what settings to use on his PC? So, yeah, Rob does this. Yeah, think. for sure. So uh, if you go to support.plex.tv and their articles section in there, uh, they've got all the information you asked for. Uh, it's a substantial amount of reading if you want to get through all of it. Um, but it's it's well explained. It's all the things that you're looking for that you asked for in terms of naming your files and setting up your PC as your Plex media server. They also have a forum. It's forums. Uh, plural dot plex dot tv uh, but if you just want to ask questions of other plex users uh, they have a forum as well so between those two resources you really can find everything when it comes to the naming convention uh, it's not complicated but they'll have you put like the season and episode order in there and it will automatically pull down the metadata from the uh, tv um, metadata uh, what is it the tv database there's the movie db and i think it's tv db or something like that for all the metadata but once you have them named as they describe in their articles uh it does look slicker because it combines the seasons together uh within the show and then it gives right. you the synopses for each episode and which actors are in it all that stuff comes in in the metadata versus if you just have the mkv default file name it doesn't necessarily know what to look up correctly it just knows the show pretty much um so yeah it, it can look slicker it can uh, work a little bit smoother and uh, the support articles over at Plex official. All right, Rob, not this Rob, different Rob. Rob took our, some of our previous advice when he purchased five RBH Impression Series bookshelf speakers, which no longer exists, and dual SVS PB1000 subs, which still exist. He also got a little creative for decoupling his subwoofers. He took inexpensive exercise floor tiles and trimmed them to fit nicely under subs. He doubled them up to make them about an inch thick, and they seemed to work perfectly beneath his PB1000s. I think that sounds fantastic. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that worked real well. <laughs> Stiff enough to not compress, but squishy enough to still be a spring. Perfect. Yeah. He hasn't installed room treatments yet, but he got he plans to go DIY using Roxel insulation. His front three speakers are behind his acoustically transparent screen. They are rear ported and he has used side clamping wall mounts to hold them in position. So he only has about four inches from the rear ports to the physical front wall and there's three inches from the fronts of the speakers to the back of the screen. Should he have absorption behind his speakers in that four inch space behind the ports? And if so, he has some egg crate foam on hand. Would that be sufficient or does he need to make uh, panels from Roxel? I don't really think their egg crate does much, honestly. Do not use the foam. Uh, the foam um, does essentially nothing. So don't yeah. don't use the foam. I would put something back there. I would too. I, w I would put, you know, an inch or two of uh, a panel back there. And because you are, uh, it's behind, you don't, have, you don't, it's behind your screen. You don't even have to dress it up and make right. it look nice. You could just, just like glue it to the wall or something. Just <laughs> you know raw I mean? <laughs> Roxel insulation. Yeah. You don't need a frame. You don't need any fabric over it. No. You just need it on the wall behind the ports of your speakers. I'd go for yeah. a couple of inches. You say you got four inches. I'd go for two inches of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, That that's as 
cheap and easy as it gets, I think. I, I wouldn't have expected that you're going to hear a massive difference, but I think that measurement-wise and uh, being able to, you know, like, uh, run your Odyssey or whatever room correction system you have, you might find it, it gives you a little bit better performance mm -hmm. on that end. I don't know that you just, like, just throwing it up there, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is totally different. Well, I mean, to be I, honest... I, I, I would cover more, like, I wouldn't put up just, like, a, a one-foot square behind each port. Right. I'd, like, I'd cover as much of the, the wall, wall as you can. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd just buy bats of it and yeah. put it back there. <laughs> Take it out of the box and just lean it up in the corners and <laughs> just put it you back there. You might need there. to secure just... it a little bit, but just, yeah, just raw insulation. And, yeah, what what if the screen is all you have that's visually covering, then, then cover the... What what would fit behind the screen? Just make all of yeah. that insulation back there. Alex. Alex asks, what do we recommend for basic surge protection for a TV, AV receiver, a few sources, and a sub? And will a basic wall outlet surge protector provide protection in the event of a lightning strike? Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, uh, but any cable that's going into your system has to go through your surge protector. Yeah. Protector. So... If everything is self-contained, meaning that all you're doing is plugging everything into its into each other and into the wall, then you can use uh, like like we said, we prefer if you used one that had the full 15 amps for your receiver and uh, subwoofer. And that. I would I would still plug the subwoofer directly into the wall, but mm -hmm. if you really really were worried about yeah. it. I would, then you could get the, the, the full. And then the APC H series, which we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, is still up and run up there and available. And that would be one that you could use uh, for this. Uh, last time I bought one, I got the H15 or something like that. I think I got that for 100 bucks on like a Black Friday or mm -hmm. a, you know one of those kind of sales. So Labor Day is coming up. If you're in the U.S., there's going to be sales. I would be looking for stuff. Uh, for that and that with that you'll also have the ability to plug your cable mm -hmm. the little cable thingy into a surge protector and uh, I think they may even have ethernet I'm pretty there, sure it has ethernet as well yeah not 100% yeah, yeah. Uh, as uh, this yeah. is one of those weeks where the news and some of the questions line up uh, so I yeah. mean I would have been pointing you to uh, a J type uh, before because I do like having battery backup if at all possible it's almost always Eden. useful um, technically ask for a battery backup. But he didn't so technically ask it. for it. That's yeah. right. So if you really don't need uh, battery backup, the H-Type is wonderful from APC. But if you do want some battery backup, uh, so now I'm going to be pointing you to the Back UPS Pro Gaming Performance Series. Uh, I'd probably go ahead because the prices aren't that different from model to model. So I'd go ahead and get the 1500 uh, if you can because that's going to give you the longest battery life and the, and the largest uh, available wattage draw from the batteries. And it does have surge-only outputs. But... As mentioned, they are limited to 12 amps. So if you wanted something, like let's say your subwoofer is not where the rest of your gear is anyway, but you still want to have an additional surge protector on there, the one I've recommended for a long time is APC's P8V. Um, it does let through the full 15 amps, and they even mention with the P8V, uh, first of all, uh, there is always a rating on surge protectors, or at least it should be listed. If it's been properly tested, as APCs are, it'll be there, which is the let-through voltage, which means in the event of a huge spike or a lightning strike, how much voltage does get through, because it's not zero. Uh, so the P8V is rated for 300 volts, which of course is you know substantially higher than the regular 120 on North American outlets, but it's... I mean, a re something really, really sensitive, I suppose, but most devices, uh, if it's a momentary spike to 300 volts, it's not going to kill them. And that's the whole idea. And a lot of other surge protectors are rated to 600 or 800 volts. So this is actually on the conservative end of what's available. And they mention it ha this, the P8V actually has a thermal fuse protection. So in addition to just the voltage, if the heat gets high enough, it'll just fuse itself and refuse to send any power through whatsoever. So as far as lightning strikes go, that's about as good as you can do for a, you know, a regular reasonable price. If you want the very best protection, the very, very best, where it won't even self-sacrifice, you know, this APC will self-sacrifice if there's a lightning strike. You'll have to replace it, but hopefully it protects all of your gear. If you want the very best that doesn't even self-sacrifice, there is Surge X. 
and Surge X does right. have a, um, a battery backup unit. Uh, now, there's it's the uh, UPS 1000 Li, standing for Line Interactive, and two. I guess this is version two. Uh, there are only six outlets on the back, only four of which are battery protected, and the other two are uh, surge only. They are high current. They let through the full 15 amps, as we would fully expect from Surge X. It is a $1,500 device. So it's not a cheap battery backup and surge protector, but if you want the very best protection that won't even sacrifice itself, I can definitely recommend them because they're pretty awesome. Alex. Oh, wait, no, I already said Alex. <laughs> I didn't scroll down. Sorry. Uh, Joey. Joey is the go-to guy in his friend group when it comes to audio video stuff, which means he just tells us. He asks us, and then we tell them. <laughs> him, him, and he tells them. That's how that That's works. our conjecture. That's how we think it goes That's... in our conceited heads. That's right. <laughs> we are vanity <laughs> personified. <laughs> <laughs> he recently stayed uh, for a few days over at a friend's house, and while he, he was there, they upgraded his friend's Panasonic Plasma to a 65-inch Sony OLED and added an Apple TV 4K. His friend's sound system remains on Marantz AV7703 Pre-Pro with Rotel amps and Golden Ear speakers, plus HSU VTF 15H Mark II subwoofer. I H HSU, everything they make sounds like an Iron Man Variable suit. tuning frequency, 15 for the driver size, H for high output, high, Mark high II. Point. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I know. I know what it all means. I just, <laughs> just listen, War Machine, settle, the, settle down. <laughs> Joey completely unplugged everything and did the cleaning while uh, when they made these upgrades. He upgraded the HDMI cable between the pre-pro and the TV and reprogrammed his friend's Harmony Elite remote. I hope this friend he paid you Opo or something. That's like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, he has an Oppo BDP95 Blu-ray player. And at the very beginning, after the TV change, it worked properly. But right after Joey had reprogrammed the Harmony and it was testing it out, the Oppo lost audio. And then it also turned the image mm -hmm. pink and would flicker sometimes. Mm -hmm. He researched online. The only thing he could find was a suggestion to con contact Oppo for a firmware update that does not automatically download via the player itself. Have you ever heard of this issue? Do we know the cause? Is there a fix? So, Oppo, blah, blah, blah. After we reprogrammed it, blah, blah, blah. We have come across this before. Have we? Yes, indeed. Although this... the last time there's tinted purple and his is tinting pink. Uh, but this is the similar issue. And it is due to uh, in the AV receiver and in the television, uh, if you're sending 4K sources with HDCP 2.2, uh, you have to turn on the enhanced HDMI input. Uh, there's the mm. standard in HDMI input and the enhanced HDMI input for uh, 18 gigabit per second signals. And you have to turn those on, which I assume he's done because he bought a new Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Uh, or what was it? For uh, Apple TV 4K? Whatever it was. Yeah. Apple TV 4K. Apple yeah, TV new 4K. 4K source. So in the Sony OLED and uh, in the Marantz AV7703, you would have turned on the enhanced HDMI version. And... The BDP-95 being a Blu-ray player, not Ultra HD Blu-ray player, older model at this point, it does not play nice with the enhanced setting. It has to be on the standard mm. setting. Now, that's a hassle and a half to have to change it back. On the TV, you can set it input by input, but on the AV receiver, you can't. On the AV receiver, it's all or nothing, enhanced or standard. So you could, I suppose, program the Harmony Elite sequence to switch back and forth right. between that HDMI nightmarish. enhanced and standard. Uh, I agree since there is the firmware update available, request it because that pretty much fixes this. Uh, yes, it does mean you have to install it from a USB stick that they send you, uh, but that's, that's the way to come at this, honestly. And yeah, that's the cause. The standard versus enhanced. So he was planning on getting a Sony Ultra HD Blu-ray player, which model would we recommend? Not a Sony. So there's the one. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, there was the the Panasonic was the 420 or 450 is the one that's not available here. Yeah, the 450. The, that we like. the 450 would be a lovely choice uh, because yeah. the 450, the Panasonic UB 450, does all of the HDR formats including Dolby Vision and HDR10+, Plus, but it does not have the HDR optimizer. But the Sony television that you got does very good tone mapping, so I wouldn't be super worried about not having the HDR optimizer. But you cannot get the UB450 Panasonic in North America. Um, the UB420 does have the HDR optimizer, but it does not have Dolby Vision. And you got this lovely Sony OLED, and I'm kind of betting you want 
Dolby Vision. The Sony OLEDs yeah. um, are okay handling Dolby Vision from an external source. Um, so, yeah, if you want it, then it's the Panasonic UB820. It is a $500 player, although Best Buy has it on sale for $400 right now. There you so go. It's not too, too bad. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend a Sony Ultra HD Blu-ray player, even though you just bought a Sony TV. Uh, because even though they technically support Dolby Vision, uh, you have to manually turn it on and off. If you ever do turn it on because you, you, you're playing an Ultra HD Blu-ray disc that you know has Dolby Vision on it, so you manually turn it on, which you have to do because it won't automatically detect it, then when you go to play the next Ultra HD Blu-ray disc that maybe doesn't have Dolby Vision on it, the player still outputs a Dolby Vision signal because you have to manually turn it back off. It's insane. The, right. the Panasonics work properly and probably just get a UB820. So his friend's plasma used to randomly shut, uh, turn off sometimes. It was just inconsistent. He could watch for hours without a problem some days, and the other days it would turn off all by itself multiple times. It had always been plugged directly into the wall outlet, which is not what we re recommend. For a TV. We recommend putting yeah. it for a TV. We recommend turning it uh, into an, uh, plugging into a surge protector. Uh, the rest of this gear was plugged into a Panamax uh, M5300 power filter. That's not a surge protector, though? Is well, it? the, the is Panamax it? is a surge protector, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And it's, sometimes when they say power filter, what they mean is it just regulates power, but uh, doesn't necessarily... No, it's, it's a surge protector, and it is a filter, uh, but mm -hmm. it is not a voltage regulator, although they try to get tricky in the marketing because it has voltage monitoring, but it's not a voltage regulator, and it's not a battery backup. So while Joey was at his house, his friends knew Sony OLED never powered off by itself. But, of course, a couple of days after Joey left, his friend called to say the OLED had randomly shut off now. Joey actually took the plasma home with him and has never turned off on its own at Joey's place. So that's why Joey did all this stuff, so he get free plasma. Mm. So Joey figured it must be something to do with that particular wall outlet that the TV is plugged into. He got his friend to plug the Panamax into that wall outlet and then plug everything, including the TV, into the Panamax. The TV still shut off randomly, but the sound system was still working. The Panamax has volt voltage monitoring, but not voltage regulations regulation it says it will shut off power to protect devices if a the voltage sags or spikes it never did that but the tv and only the tv still shut off so any ideas joey told his friend to call an electrician to check the tv <laughs> should not be pulling more voltage than like the subwoofers <laughs> oh i just uh... i just I, I i just don't know i mean it, it does sound like maybe i mean it's it... no i i I don't know. What this sounds like to me is where sometimes the neutral and the ground have been wired together. Um, yeah. And that that can cause this issue, but I would expect the Panamax to give you a warning about that because it, it... I would expect more than just the TV to shut off. I know. <laughs> I mean, I would expect other things to shut off as well, not just the TV. I, I, so I would, ex I would the expect the, the Panamax to give you a light and a warning tone because it, it is able to detect like a wiring fault um or, or a large sag or a large spike it, this is strange um i mean it almost makes me wonder could it be an hdmi cec problem but why i, I don't even know if his old pa uh, plasma had hdmi cec <laughs> it's, right it's... well and, and then you think you know where is it coming from it, i know i mean it would be coming from is this the guy with the pre-pro uh, I feel like this is the guy with the pre-pro. Uh, right? yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. It is a Marant AV7703 yeah. pre-pro. Yeah. So I guess the only... Yeah, so if it had HDMI CEC, for some reason we could be getting some sort of weird interaction. You know, like it's going to sleep I mean, Joey something. did all this I... Harmony Elite programming. I... I would assume I he had believe. turned CEC off and everything, although maybe he didn't. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, out, outside of some, like I say, even if... I, I think you got to call it Like, I used, I used <laughs> to have, like, way back when I had a rear projection... Uh, did I have a Hitachi? I'm pretty sure it was a Hitachi rear projection. It was still 4x3 at the time. It was like a 43-inch, 4x3-shaped rear projection Hitachi CRT. And it was technically capable of taking in and showing a 720p signal uh but Fancy. uh if i ever did that because what was it the was the place playstation 2 was actually like technically capable of doing it and i think 
the Matrix game was like the only game that ever used it. But anyway, I tried to do it and it would shut itself off after like 45 minutes because it just got too hot trying to show things at 720p on that old CRT. Right. Uh, but that was like the only time I came across something like this where it wasn't an electrical fault and nothing else ever shut itself off. Only the TV did, but it was because it was overheating. Now I wonder, could it be a heat issue? Does he have this thing mounted above a with fireplace with the fireplace TVs? on? <laughs> You know, I mean, well, I guess, yeah. I mean, in August, I know, right? <laughs> where but he, where does he live? I guess he lives in Australia. Is it, I mean, is it uh, South Africa. Wall mounted to a wall that's like right where some kind of heat thing goes. I, like, I'm just, I'm pulling at straws here, obviously, but so is Joey. So could well that you, you. I mean, we didn't really hear uh, how it was mounted or anything. Right. But what if it was in some sort of like makeshift pitcher frame or something ah, like that? Some sort of box like recessed into you know, the to, wall. To, to, recess into the wall and it wasn't getting good adequate ventilation yeah. I, I guess that would make that'd be about the only physical thing i right. can think of other than some sort of electrical problem but i don't understand how it's just the tv i know so yeah, it's got the, the electrical thing seems really unlikely having plugged the panamax yeah. into that outlet i mean i'm yeah. glad you suggested yeah. that i would have too because it, it is designed to detect if there's a ground fault or a problem yeah. in the voltage it would have given an alert so I, I almost have to think this is a heat issue. Um, yeah. And I mean, since the plasma that was turning off at his place is not at yours, then that doubly makes me think it's that. Because like I say, yeah. the only thing that ever made a TV of mine turn off was was getting too hot. Yeah, I can't. I, that's, that's about the only thing I yeah. can think of too. Uh, let us know, because I'm interested mm -hmm. now. Martin. Martin says he listens to our podcast while wa he is walking his dog, Daisy. Hi, Daisy. Being part of the two plus hour club might be a bit much for her. We have seen a picture of Daisy lounging on the grass. <laughs> he is holding a leash, yep. which makes me think this was mid walk, and Daisy decided yep. to take a little break during the two hour runtime of our podcast. Can't blame you, Daisy. Don't blame you at all. Yeah. It's hot out there. We've said many times on the podcast that when it comes to Atmos overhead speakers, just about any reasonable speakers will do, and having a perfect timbre match to the floor level speakers isn't vital. But Dolby says, right in their installation guidelines, that Atmos speakers ought to match as perfectly as possible. So how does he reconcile these desperate suggestions? Uh, Dolby's just saying the thing that will get them sued the least, and we have no money, so we don't care, and we'll tell you the truth. Yeah, I mean, they, they can't go wrong telling you that, hey, if right. all your speakers match, that's the best available option. I mean, heck. It's also true. I can kind of agree with that. at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, uh, we know that it doesn't matter. From I mean, experience, it, from firsthand yeah, experience, from experience. Uh, the amount of sound, first of all, that comes out of the Atmos speakers, and then the range of frequencies played within those speakers... Um, versus how well we hear above us while other sounds, particularly in front of us, are still going on, because the number of times there's a sound exclusively above us. Has that ever happened? I don't know. <laughs> there's no other sound besides something directly above? Maybe. Maybe it's I'm okay. sure it has. Uh, maybe uh, uh, A quiet place, maybe? Uh, could be. Could be. But where it sounds are, are primarily overhead, maybe? But in any event, would... even if it is, it's uh, fleeting. You, you don't have yeah. sounds continuously going on exclusively above you for prolonged amounts of time. Uh, so, yeah, in, in terms of real world experience, uh, how vital we think it is that the timbre match is absolutely perfect. Uh, I would put it a notch below how important I think it is for surround backs and uh, how important I think it is for front heights. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, you, you can definitely get away with a, a non perfect timbre match. I mean, you don't want to be completely wildly right. different. But right, uh, anything right, right, reasonable right. will work nicely. So Martin uses a Trip Light Smart Pro 1500 battery backup. It has five battery outlets and five surge-only outlets. He has an Emotiva XPA5 amplifier, and he plugged it directly into a dedicated 15-amp circuit. But would it be a better to, idea to plug it into one of the surge-only outlets of his Trip Light? Would his particular model be able to supply the necessary current? Yeah, I mean, you would want to plug it into the 15-amp one that can give you the full 15 mm -hmm. amps you can also just plug it directly into the wall because i think well that's what he's done at the moment amps. yeah yeah oh is that what he's yeah, saying yeah because it's I, a dedicated amp circuit. circuit yeah so. oh I, I thought that that was the one of that 15 amp outlet on this the trip no line. no i all all uh emotiva amps to my knowledge have a fuses yep. so you are and safe they say right in their manuals 
plug it into the wall, please. Um, yeah. So to answer, I looked up his trip light model. It is limited to 12 amps. Uh, we are yeah. talking about an XPA-5, which uh, it, it can draw some power. It can draw some 1,500 volt amps. Uh, so yeah, I, I would suggest keeping it the way you have it <laughs> and following Emotiva's own directions. Because if something goes wrong, uh, you can point right to their own manual and say, that's what you told me to do. Mitch. Mitch says, we explained why uh, we recommend labeling four overhead speakers as front heights and rear heights, even if they're physically positioned where Dolby says to label them top fronts and top rears. But Mitch recalls how we also mentioned that some Atmos movies are mixed as though they are four overhead channels with fixed positions rather than making use of the object-based audio emitted data to move around the coordinates of overhead sounds. And furthermore, those fixed positions are pretty much always top fronts and top mm -hmm. rears. So if a movie is mixed that way, how does it sound if you've labeled your speakers as front and rear heights? And also, how does it sound if you have top middles? Uh, do they ever do channels for overheads? I thought the channel part, we, they, we would hear the channels in the lower section and that would be objects overhead. Is that, am I remembering that incorrectly? So yeah, the way it is on a technical side the overhead sounds uh, in Dolby Atmos are not channels, but some studios like uh, Wonder Woman is the easiest example to give of this. Um, what they did was give four fixed coordinate positions. Yeah. So they aren't using, so it is object based audio. That's how it's encoded as objects, but they just used four fixed coordinate positions. And then if they wanted to pan any sounds, they did it the same way you would with channels, as in they just increased or decreased the volume levels between those four fixed positions rather than using the metadata to move the coordinates, which they could have done, right. but they chose not to. They chose to act as if it were channels. So, the good news is, with Dolby Atmos, if it is overhead sounds that are in any of the overhead positions, uh, those sounds will play exclusively out of whatever overhead speakers you have. So right. if you have uh, speakers that are physically positioned where Dolby would say to have them as top fronts and top rears, but you have relabeled them as front heights and rear heights, and then you get something like Wonder Woman that has these fixed... Uh, coordinate positions, it will still play them out of the speakers you have labeled as front heights and rear heights because those are your available overhead speakers. And mm. Dolby Atmos, it just works wonderfully that way. Uh, there's no problem. It's still discrete. It still plays out of the speakers it should play out of. And when you go over to a DTS-X disc, you don't get the situation where a sound that was supposed to be overhead also gets played out of your front left right speakers or also gets played out of your surround back speakers uh, because now you've labeled them as front heights and rear heights and it plays them discreetly. If you have top middles, if you had only top middles, you've got a 5.2.2 or a 7.2.2 system, then all of the overhead sounds, no matter where they might have been, coord uh, the coordinates might say to play them, uh, in Dolby Atmos, they'll play out of your top middles because that's all you have overhead is top middles. So all the sounds will come out of there. If you have labeled them as front heights and top middles, it'll just say, what is my farthest forward speakers and what are my farthest back speakers and I'm going to get as close as I can. <laughs> so what was top fronts will play out of your front heights and what was top rears will play out of your top middles now. Uh, because again, Atmos doesn't try to put sounds that are overhead uh, partially into your floor level speakers to try and move them that way while DTSX does. Right. Uh, in Mitch's case, his four overhead speakers are at 55 or 60 degree uh, elevation angles, basically as short a distance in front and behind the seats as Dolby guidelines would allow for top fronts and rear, top rears, and closer to the seats than would be allowed for front and rear heights. He's outside the range where tops and heights overlap in Dolby's, Dolby's guidelines. Mm -hmm. So would it still be beneficial to him to relabel them as heights? Yes. At this point, well, I mean... It, 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 when you've got two speakers mounted to your ceiling and we are talking about whether or not you should label them one thing or another and literally it's a couple of button presses for you to check it but you have <laughs> to rerun odyssey to get it working properly so it's not completely yeah trivial. it's not completely trivial but you know this is something you can test i would do it and then you know live with it for a while and see if 
you thought one of two things. Either you thought, wow, I'm noticing a difference mm -hmm. and it's good. Or, wow, I'm not noticing anything, which is what I think you're going to say. And I mean, if you never play DTS X content, you're never going to notice the difference. Atmos is right. going to sound exactly the same as it sounds right now. If you change the labels and rerun Odyssey, so now they're labeled as front heights, rear heights, Atmos isn't going to sound any different than what you have right now. It's only going to be DTS X that might sound different. Right. So, I mean, I would do it and just live with it for a while. And if you don't ever notice the difference, you can be lazy and not change it back <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that's what probably is going to happen more often than not michael after some fairly lengthy shipping delays michael received his gig acoustics uh panels and soffit bass traps uh soffit bass trap he's loving them and gick was very good about maintaining communication throughout the shipping delay so he's he is happy to continue recommending them naturally with new acoustic treatments in place he rerun odyssey using the editor app he has taken to cutting off uh, the eq range at 500 hertz and focusing on on just eqing the bass but then he tried switching to the flat setting and while he didn't like the bass as much he did like the treble extension a little bit better so how does he get the best of both worlds can he can he keep the flat setting and then manually adjust the bass eq uh, in the Odyssey editor app. So I, I guess before it was, he didn't have it on flat. What did he have? Well, this... so when you use the Odyssey editor app, any changes that you make in the app only apply to the Odyssey reference setting right. in the AV receiver. So unfortunately, it's not as simple as just switching it to flat and then using the Odyssey editor app to do whatever he does in the base because he does some manual right. changes to the target curve in the base that he prefers. That's great. Um, but it's not as simple as just switching it to flat and then making those changes in the base. What you would have to do is no longer truncate the range of the yes. EQ uh, at 500 hertz. You'd have to allow the full range of EQ and then manually change the target curve in the Odyssey editor app to uh, basically a flat line in the treble instead of the roll-off. They give you a choice of two different roll-offs in the app, uh, but you just want to manually change that to a flat line because that's what the flat setting is. Hmm. That, that I mean, this is one of those times where somebody has listened to us or listened to other people and have decided that the, the best way to do a thing is to do what the, this person has said. Mm -hmm. And then they try the automated version. I'm like, wow, this automated version actually has some benefit. How do I reconcile the two? <laughs> uh, you know, there's a reason why Odyssey set these target curves to be what they are. You know, and there's a reason why some people, you know, why we, some people keep the, like, I don't do this. I don't cut off the EQ. I right. let it EQ the whole thing. Uh, I don't think it's doing much up top. I don't think it needs to, <laughs> but I it's it's there in case there is a problem. And I think what you've experienced is the the especially when you added all these room treatments to your mm -hmm. room, you probably deadened your room a mm -hmm. lot more than you were used to. Yeah. So what Odyssey did by allowing it to EQ all the way up is you know that reverberation that was uh, that was giving you a lot more trouble in your room is suddenly gone mm -hmm. and it's not adding that reverberation back but it is increasing the volume so that you're getting a more clarity than you had before um and this is where you know odyssey the more the better the room is to begin with right the better job it can do and the you know uh yeah if you're in a fairly not good room then you know let it focus on the base and just forget everything else mm -hmm. because it's not going to be able to do much whatever it does is probably not going to be very helpful but in a room that's been treated suddenly it can fine tune this quite a bit so uh you know it just just always be open to, to saying, you know, yes, I know that so-and-so said that this is the best way to do it, but it's okay to just try all of it. It's there, <laughs> you know, it's literally switching between reference and flat and you go, okay, this is pretty easy. But at so. the same time to get the same EQ that he knows he likes that he manually achieved in the yeah. base, uh, but yeah. then to keep the, so one thing I want to mention is, so I, I think, the advice, I, that's the only way I know how to come at this, which is to still use the Odyssey Editor app, still make the changes you want to in the base, but don't truncate it anymore and manually change the treble roll off to a flat line. But um, at around 16 to 18 kilohertz, which you probably can't hear anyway, depending on your age, uh, but you probably still want to put in a roll off way, way up there. 
Uh, because if you really try to just draw a completely flat line all the way out to past 20 kilohertz, that can occasionally cause some issues with some speakers. You don't want to end up harming a tweeter or just getting some weird distortion or something like that, uh, which isn't really necessary. So like I said, like, very few of us can still hear above 18 kilohertz uh, how much vital information is right. up there anyway so just for the protection of your speakers at like 16 to 18 kilohertz i'd still have a uh, actually a fairly steep roll off way way up there yeah robert robert has a lg c8 oled in the oppo 203 ultra hd blu-ray player and a nad t758 v3 av receiver would there be any benefit to using both of the Oppo's HDMI outputs to run video directly to the OLED and audio only to the receiver? Does the NAD pass through all the stuff? Because if it doesn't, I then don't yes. <laughs> no, it definitely yeah. passes through 18 gigabits per second. So that part okay. is no problem. I don't know if it passes through Dolby Vision. I'm not okay. sure. It's well, I don't, I don't it seems like it should. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's you can do the 18 enough, gigabits per second. It's old enough that yeah. it was in that time when not every receiver did pass through Dolby Vision. Um, and I don't know if it I don't know if it did to begin with. And if it did not, I don't know if it got an update to do so. It's questionable. If it does pass through Dolby Vision, because, I mean, you've got an Ultra HD Blu-ray player and a television that can both do Dolby Vision. So, hey, it'd be nice to use it. Uh, so... That's easy enough to test, you know? You turn both Dolby Vision on in your Oppo, uh, you play a Dolby Vision Ultra HD Blu-ray, and if it doesn't come through, because the LG will light up what type of HDR right, it right, is right, showing, right, right. Uh, right. if it doesn't light up as Dolby Vision, then you know your NAT isn't passing it through, and that would be a reason to send the video directly to the TV and the audio separately to the uh, NAD receiver. But if Dolby Vision does light up, then your NAD is doing all the things it needs to do, and there's no reason to run two cables. Right, so... To answer the more general question is, uh, is passing through video through a receiver in some way going to harm the video signal? Because if, if the question is, so the question we answered is, if your NAD is passing through all the things, right. then there's no reason not to send it through the NAD. Yeah. Uh, rather than buying a second HDMI cable and doing all this, all this yeah. stuff. But for uh to answer the more general question is there some sort of video degradation that might mm -hmm. happen or or you know scaling or something that might happen at the receiver level uh that could harm the video signal or you know is a tv just better at receiving it than 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 the the, the receiver the receiver unless you have set it to do something or it's by default set to do something to the video signal passes it through bit for bit no problem right that, that this is the easiest of things to do for the receiver <laughs> and it should not affect anything and in fact passing it through the receiver many times means that you get things like overlays and you know pop-ups and you know vault you can see what the volume is and you can press the info button and see what you know bit rate you're getting and all sorts of other things so there are real reasons to pass it through there are no objective reasons not to pass it through unless you have an old enough receiver that it's incapable of passing through everything it's supposed to right so that that answers the, the sort of general question let's do one more or is that the, is this the last one uh, no like there it goes all the way up to 21 but uh yeah I, that's good we put a big big dent in it this week bob bob bought a 5.1 svs system with ultra speakers and the sb2000 sub standard voltage uh, in the Philippines, it's 220 volts, but unlike the UK, it's at 60 hertz, not 50 hertz. They use both uh, type AB, North American, and type C, UK outlets. So for the subwoofer, Bob needed 220 volts, 60 hertz with a type B, a three-prong American-style plug, I think. Yeah, Is that right? that's right. Yeah. He wrote to SVS, and they said they could accommodate that, so he placed the order. When it arrived, it had the correct plug, but no outward indication that it was 220 volts instead of only uh, instead of 120. So he wisely con contacted them again and quickly replied, they did, telling him to unscrew and remove the amp and check for a jumper on the circuit board. It's a good thing they did because the jumper was in place with the circuit board clearly labeled it as follows. So, uh, what, open input okay whatever there's a picture here and there's a little wire jumper thingy and then it it says whatever it says, it says open that means the input is set to 230 volts shorted the input is set to 120 volts and the jumper right. is in place so it is shorted so 
as it arrived, it was set for 120 volts. So it's a good thing yeah. you checked. Very, very wise, so There was Bob. nothing <laughs> to indicate that this was uh, anything other than a standard North American version of the subwoofer. So are all F SVS's sledge amplifiers designed to operate on both 120 and 230, or did they actually use a special circuit board for the one that he had bought? There's no way they did that. No, no. <laughs> they're, they're all like that. In fact, uh, many, I'm surprised you actually had to take the amp off to do this. Mm -hmm. Many, I, I've seen many a subwoofer amp that has a sw like a little switch that you can't really hit with your finger. Right. You've got to get a little screwdriver yeah. or something. Sometimes they even have it. a little plastic thing over plastic it that you have cover. to unscrew or something, but it's still yeah. semi-accessible. From the outside yeah and you just flick it in, into 220 yeah. which does the same thing that you did by pulling the wire mm -hmm. out uh so yeah most amps it just makes sense <laughs> from a yeah. from a manufacturing standpoint that you don't build two different amps one for you know 121 yeah. for 230 because why would you? And SVS you know, most it, definitely does sell globally, so there is there is no chance that this is not the same circuit board found in every single one of these <laughs> uh, amplifiers right. inside of their subwoofers. But very good on you for checking because that was uh, good. Yeah, I yeah, would not have that. That I could have been have a problem. That was very. You know yeah. what? I'm I'm betting. In the past, Bob has run into issues with voltage yeah. things and uh, yeah. knows now that it's always worth double checking, but that's very yeah. wise. That was quick, so let's do Jim real okay. quick. Jim, can you make use of the subwoofer crawl for dual or multiple subwoofers? Not really. No. <laughs> no. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, because you, you, can't, you can't put your ear... Well, it wouldn't... Basically, go to AV Rant and we'll link up the how to calibrate dual subwoofers yep. in a non-standard room or non-standard configuration. It is the 12-step guide to setting up dual subwoofers from AV Rant if you just want to Google it ahead of looking up the uh, the link. But uh, no, yeah, you can't do a subwoofer crawl because you can't put two subs in your seat and then you are simultaneously in two places. That's one reason why right. uh, it doesn't work for multiple. But the main reason is um, with one subwoofer and doing the subwoofer crawl, uh, you're doing this reciprocity thing where the the wave pattern that is generated with the subwoofer at your seat and then you crouching down where the subwoofer might live uh, when you then reverse those positions and the subwoofer is by the wall and you're back in the seat the wave pattern is reciprocal uh, back and forth but once you add a second subwoofer anywhere in the room now the wave pattern right. has changed you have changed the wave pattern uh, to what was going on there so you, you there is no effective way to do a subwoofer crawl with dual or more subs that's right so is he correct in thinking you should use the subwoofer crawl to find the best position for sub one and then simply put sub two on the opposite wall no no <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly enough this is it's even easier than that mm. okay you don't need to find the good place for your sub right. if your room is rectangular if your room is not rectangular then it doesn't matter because <laughs> no, no amount of crawling and doing you know uh there is no reciproc there's no mirroring yeah so what you want is midpoints of either your front or your side walls both either one okay so you know front and back or side to side or cor opposite corners so front right back left front left back right or mirrored in some way so if it's if because of furniture and other things that are going on mm -hmm. if you have to have it on the back wall you know, three feet in, then put it on the front wall three feet in. And that, that therefore they're mirrored. That's how you do it. You don't care where the good spot is because the good spot no longer becomes the good spot right. when you add a second sub subwoofer. <laughs> yeah. So you could have that's all you, you could have, have found do. the good spot for one sub, but then when you add the second sub anywhere in the room, including directly across from it, uh it might not any longer be the good spot for just the one sub, but if you have the two subs across the room from one another. You can always imagine if you drew a line from sub one to sub two, that that line would go through the very middle of your room. That's how you can always make sure that they're aligned properly across a rectangular room. Uh, yeah, that's how that yeah. does that in a rectangular room, but then... <laughs> if it's not. So what if having two subwoofers directly across the room from each other isn't an option, or if the room is open and cannot be enclosed? Mm -hmm. And again, this comes back to... Yeah, put them where you can. Yep. Depending, you know, the with within some caveats, and then you do the twelve step thing that Rob has written up, and it's painful. It's tedious. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's tedious, but it's it'll it'll work. Yeah. So uh, I will still advise, regardless of the type of room that you have, you want to have the two subs 
basically as far apart from each other as you can get them uh, because that right. gives you the best chance of having the most uh, even and fewest number of really, really bad dips in your frequency response. And that's where you want to begin. But with that as your starting point, the two subs physically about as far as part as they can reasonably get, then uh, you're going to play with the phase knob of one of the subs. Uh, the sub that is physically closer to you is the one that you want to play with. And uh, yeah, a little at a time, listening in multiple positions to a bass sweep on repeat. Uh, you might go insane, but uh, as we talked about with Lee on his review of the dual SB2000 Pro SVS subwoofers, if you find a setting on that phase knob where you're going to focus on like a three-seater couch and you're playing the bass sweep on repeat and you're looking for uniformity across those three seats. Not necessarily perfect linearity at this point, but uniformity. Uh, and you find one where you're like, hey, that's pretty good. You're done. Don't keep looking for perfection. Don't keep right. even looking for better. Uh, you get something where you're like, I sat in all three seats and that bass sweep sounded pretty, very similar in all three of those right. seats. You're done and move on to equalization. All right, Rob, who do we have left? We have Tim C, Infinite Gary, and Sean M. That's it. Look at all, all right. those questions we got through. Wonderful. I know. We're going to thank uh, our listeners of the week. We're going to thank Dennis, Benjamin, and Chad for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, as well as our 20, 125 patrons over at patreon.com. For sure. Dennis, Benjamin, Chad, thank you so much for those PayPal donations. Really appreciate that. And over at patreon.com slash podcast, we have 125 patrons. Thank you so much for the support. I also want to thank Aris for talking us up to abt and av science when he bought his new stuff and uh, notes of gratitude from jack josh and Alex. indeed rs thank you so much for talking us up to abt and uh, av science that that is such a weird name abt ab they should just call themselves abt but i'm sure on their youtube videos i heard them say it and uh jack josh and alex thank you very much for the notes of gratitude for keeping this podcast going thank you everybody for continuing to listen and sending in your questions to question at avrant.com our email address we really really appreciate keeping this community going for av rant i'm tom Andre, and i'm rob h now stay in and listen to something Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.